Hey everyone, welcome to Know Your Gear Live QA episode 302. So hopefully you guys can see me and hear me okay. And uh, and how you guys doing? Was it a good week? Oh, it's buffering. That's not good. All right, we might have problems. We're having trouble with our internet. Hey Oops, as you can see, we were having some technical difficulties with the internet. So we'll hope that it works. Um, all right. So we have a lot of things to cover today, including uh, I got some stuff on my agenda. We have obviously subjects and questions to talk about, and we also have uh, a giveaway. So we're going to be giving away something. I'll have to grab it sometime during the show because um, I forgot it in the other room. And um, all right. So I think we should just jump into it, right? Let's just get into stuff. Let's go. Oh, you know what we should do first? That's what we'll do first. Uh, I have to some of my announcements. This one's actually important. Um, I got some questions during the week sent to the Ask Know Your Gear uh, a podcast website. So if you guys don't know, there's a website called Ask. Uh, no, not called Ask. It's called uh, <laughs> www.knowyourgearpodcast.com. And uh, you can ask questions there and they come to us. And uh, one of the questions was that someone noticed on our Patreon page, all the tiers are locked out except for the $5 tier. And that is because we have been having trouble with uh, the spring guys who, 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 uh, send shirts, as you guys know, one of the features of the premium tiers is that, uh, if you do a year subscription, I think you get like a shirt, you know, and stuff like that. It's like a special shirt. And, uh, my wife has been working diligently with a new company to supply us new high quality, uh, merchandise, um, since we're not happy with the current spring merchandise and we're definitely not happy with the service. Uh, it's taking a month and sometimes longer to get you guys, some of your merchandise and that's just unacceptable. Keep in mind, we very make very little on those, on those purchases. And the reason I say that is not for any reason that you understand, you know, when, when you're having them take care of it and you're getting, you know, four or $5, $2, whatever is my percentage uh, of it to have you guys have horrible service is just not only unacceptable, but then on top of that, you're like, I, I don't even know why we're going to do it at all. So I almost wanted to cancel doing any merch. And, um, but uh, yeah, if you want to sign up for Patreon, you can do $5 patrons, but you will have to wait if you want higher tiers because we we don't want to have anyone sign up. And when we still owe, um, right now it feels like 10 or 20 people merchandise to some degree. So uh, she's diligently working on that. And I know a lot of you are patrons watching right now and you know that because uh, if you're waiting for your merch, you're probably in contact with her. Uh, definitely, uh, especially recently. So that's what's going on with that. On a side note, I want to take a second and thank all the new channel members. We've got a ton of channel members. Uh, if you can see them, you can see their uh, sign-on is in green, and they have the Funko Pop avatar. Uh, so thank you guys for supporting on this side, too. And then, of course, thank you guys for hanging out and supporting in all the ways you do. I'm going to refresh my screen real quick. There you go. And with all that being said, uh, that we're good with that. By the way, I'm wearing one of the new new shirts. Uh, this is one of the new shirts. The new company sending me samples and, uh, and, uh, my wife's bringing me all the samples and, and I'm checking them out. And so far I, I like it. I like this one. We've never offered, I don't say never. We offered only for a short time, this logo in color because spring couldn't get it right. <laughs> they kept sending it incorrectly. And, and, uh, I don't know. I'm done with that mess. Let's just not talk about that anymore. Let's get into guitar stuff. That's what we're here for. Anyways. Um, if one of the first questions we grabbed today was men, Ming Mingjo, I'm gonna say Mingjo 101 says, "Hey Phil, if uh, if I broke an unwrapped string, can I just uh, change that string from another brand?" Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. The answer is yes. So in other words, what what he's asking is like a brand new set of strings, right? You're you're stringing up your guitar, and especially a high uh, a high string like a high. E. You break it, you snap it. Maybe you can't get a single in the brand you have. Is there gonna be a problem? Even if it's a wound string, um, it's not. It's not. Would you notice, you could notice, because obviously different string manufacturers are going to use different different materials or makeups of those materials to make the string. So there could be a subtle difference, a subtle, and I mean subtle. Um, obviously, if you have a, uh, a, a coated string and now you're using an uncoated string, that would be a difference. Uh, but in my, in my experience, it's not a huge deal. Um, 
if you do that, uh, two things I will suggest. One, make sure that if you get a single string to replace a broken string, you're buying the same type of string. So if you have a nickel string, get a nickel string. If you have a like a pure nickel, if you have a nickel wrapped, if you have a steel string, you know, if you have something like that, like I said, if you have a coded string. And also keep in mind that a lot of times when a high E breaks on you, um, you can always reach out to the manufacturer and sometimes they'll actually send you a replacement and then and a day or two later, you can do the replacement. I can't guarantee that happens anymore, but that's how it used to work. You know, it seems like a lot of time for, a, you know, a buck and a quarter, you know, for a string. But sometimes if you want the strings to match up, that's something you can do. Um, and believe it or not, uh, I know that sounds like a, hey, reach out and, you know, kind of get a free string. But obviously you paid for the string, it broke. And even if you broke it, sometimes it's nice for them to know that they're having issues. So... There you go. One of the benefits from buying your strings from a, a mom and pop shop is a lot of times they'll have uh, singles to help you replace those too, by the way. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Andy Brown, who says, hey, Phil. Everybody says, hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. <laughs> says, hey, Phil. Uh, <laughs> if you bought a new top of the line production strat, like an Ultra or Ultra Lux, what, was, what, what would be one thing you would upgrade to improve, if anything. I would definitely probably possibly have to crown and level those frets and round those frets. Um, I have uh, I have not seen the best quality workmanship on those guitars in the last couple years. Um, so you know, so I would expect some kind of setup and some fret work on them. Um, I know that's not what you're asking, but I mean, that's what I anticipate. If you were ordering one, be prepared. That's going to be something to deal with. Um, other than that, I don't know what you would want to upgrade. You know, I'm 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 biased because I'm not a huge fan of noiseless pickups. There's only a few companies in my in my opinion that I I like, and I'm going to say my opinion of my preferences. There's only a few companies that make us a, uh, a noiseless type pickup that I like. I like Dimarzio's HS3, HS2s. I like that. That's what you saw in the Ingve Strat. I like lace pickups. Um, I don't like the lace company. I just want to say that. <laughs> it's, I, 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 but I, as a company, I, I'm not. They're not somebody I'm enthusiastic about. But as their product, um, I like their product, and I definitely like their older product than their new product. I have uh, new versions of their uh, pickups. I have every kind of lace pickup in the shop downstairs, and I have newer ones and older ones. And and I hate, I hate that. I hate to be the guy who's like the old stuff was good. Don't buy the new crap. You know, you get, you know, sometimes that's just in our head because when I would. Sometimes when you discover product and you're younger, you're so enthusiastic that you'll never have that first experience again like that. So when you get older, you know, everything's just like this memory of things being better. But I've actually like loaded them into guitars and checked them, A-B'd them, and they're just not the same to me. Um, there's very few companies that I think are are like that. I mean, some people could say, you know, Duncan's or DiMaggio's are not the same as they used to, and there's probably some merit to that. But I mean, the laces definitely seem, for some reason, the old lace sensors just they're nice i mean they're magical i hate using that but i've been using that word lately a lot magical i just like because i feel like inspired from it i strum a chord and i go man i love this the new ones are not horrible and to be honest with you it's going kind of those things where if you've never heard the product and everywhere and if you don't have an experience of what it was like before what it sounded like before i don't know if you notice what was different about it but when but i will tell you a lot of times when i meet somebody and um somebody says i don't like lace pickups that's that's you know that's fine because everybody has their own opinions however my first go-to question is always like have you tried the old ones or have you tried the new ones because to me my first experience with lace was a strat plus if you guys uh, don't know what a strat plus is just literally it's p p l u s not the plus symbol and uh you could go on reverb right now while you're watching this or uh, and listening to it later and just type in strat plus and they're beautiful guitars they tend to go for good money now man some of those guitars those those pickups in there were just fantastic um i thought i saw scott grove mentioning the fender branded ones uh when fender had them i, I absolutely agree with you scott uh those are the ones i think are the most magical <laughs> scott has a great video actually by the way um where he was uh <laughs> i guess he was arguing with lace and i'm pro i'm doing off memory because he did it a couple years back it was like before covid so it was right before covid that's all i remember and uh, and uh, I guess he was saying like he wanted some a, a, one of the pickups from them. They said they don't make that. And then he's like literally found where they had made that and they didn't even know. And I was laughing uh, because <laughs> I was laughing because 
I don't know if you guys know how much that happens. Um, companies, it's so funny, companies, this is gonna go into another subject, I can already feel it right now. Companies, we look at a company and a history of a company like Fender, right? And I'm just using Fender as a reference because they've been around since 1946. Sometimes you look at a Fender, a company like Fender, and you think, okay, they have this long history because they do, and they have amazing products because they do. But when you think of the current company or any, like over the years, all the iterations of the company, you think of a company, of course, it it knows its history. Of course, it, it knows all its products, you know, the people there. But what you realize is not only is there turnover, so there's new employees, but there's changes of regime, so to speak, you know, um, this is a, a perfect example, and this is why I said it's going to go into another subject of recently, if you saw in the news, uh, Cordoba sold Guild. They had purchased Guild from FMIC, and uh, and now they've sold it off, <laughs> right? I think that's my understanding, right? Um, and uh, I only saw it briefly, and, and uh, you know, somebody asked me, and just off the cuff, like, what do I think of that? And I said, you know, I'm a fan of Guild guitars. However, Guild has been so many different brands to me. Like, to, it's not like I'm going to say, like, this was the good years, these are the bad years. It's just they were different brands. I can think of a ton of brands like that. BC Rich is different brands to me. The brand under Bernie Rico, the brand under, you know, the next company, the brand under the next company, the brand, I think it's like four companies now, I think, is about one BC Rich. Definitely three, right? Um, I think Zoltar, so I'm probably messing up his name. I'm pretty sure it's Zoltar Bar. I'm a, I'm a fan of Five Finger Death Punch, but I know I'm messing up his name. But I'm pretty sure Zoltar owns... Um, uh, BC Rich now is my understanding. And, um, you know, and, 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 and in all fairness and BC Rich, Bill, who runs BC Rich, I think currently ran it before when it was with, I think it was with Davin Hanser, um, before. And again, I'm doing this off my memory. So if there's any inconsistency, it's not like I researched this to make this video. Um, but my point is different iterations of the company. So sometimes, uh, you, you, you talk to a company and they're telling you something or they put out some jargon or some marketing stuff and you realize like, this isn't even the same company. You know, it just has the same names. It owns all the properties, intellectual properties, but it's not the same company. This industry is riddled with that. There's a ton of companies that are not the same because they've been changing over the years. And again, not to say that they've gone from bad or good to bad or bad to good. But also another thing is... um. There's different, like I said, people at the helm of the ship. So things are totally scrapped and forgotten. And then, an, and then a new, new uh, group of, of people come in to run the company and they don't even know about the old things. Um, my, my story that would be like Scott Groves was, <laughs> was, um, when I was a Fender custom shop dealer, I really, I love seven strings, but I'm not a, I'm not a gent guy. So I don't want a seven string to chugga chugga. Um, I just want a seven string to actually thump it with my thumb. Uh, if some of you guys, I have some videos where you see that. I kind of, you know, just kind of like to thump the the low string. It just kind of it works for me rhythmically like a five string bass. And uh, so I, I wanted a Strat. I wanted a seven string Strat really, really bad. And uh, so I go, well, you know, it's one of those things where it hits you one day. Like, I'm a custom shop vendor dealer. I'll call the custom shop. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to order a custom shop Fender Strat for me seven string. And I called up Fender Custom Shop. I'll never forget this. And I said, hey, I want to order a Fender Custom Shop seven string. And they said, well, we don't make one. I said, well, let's make one. Let's do it. Right. Uh, I'm here. I'm going to buy it. Let's do it. And they said, uh, let me get back to you. <laughs> and they got back to me. I don't remember if it was hours or days. I'm pretty sure it was a few hours later. And they said, Phil, here's the problem. Uh, we've never made a seven string Strat. And so we don't, you know, the, we talked to the guys and they can't do it. I said, you never made a seven string Strat. Literally, you invented the solid body seven string guitar with the guy Maestro. And like a couple years prior to Steve I coming out with the seven string with Ivan. And, and I go, so, I mean, you you made it. The, you're the first company to ever make a solid body electric seven string. <laughs> Right. Like a part of, right. I think they made like six or seven of them. And I think Maestro got them all right, obviously. And uh, again, something else you guys can Google while I'm talking, uh, type in the Maestro and uh, Fender seven string. And it's going to come up. There's ads, uh, very Yngwie-esque type ads, uh, looking ads where he was holding his seven string Strat. And they had no idea what I was talking about. And I'm like, and I'm pretty sure they had the patent or something on it too. I think at the time, I think I even Googled it and checked and found the patent that they had. And I'm like, not only you guys can do it, you did it first. <laughs> so, and they didn't know. No one knew there because they, because here's what happened. 
no one that I was talking to, and I mean no one, had been there even close to the mid 80s when that came out. So it's even though I'm talking to Fender, I'm really not talking to Fender. It's not like, you know, um, when you're talking to somebody who's owned the company since the first day or is involved in the company since the first day. So yeah, Susan says, perhaps all new employees. Of course there's turnover, but, but a lot of times, you know, it's just funny how stuff gets mixed. And like I said, there's this, uh, like I said, I like the word reiterations, reiterations of the company, right? It's just ever evolving of all these companies. There's very few companies that I've worked with, uh, that I've noticed where, you know, it's the same, same kind of company. It was X amount of years ago. They kind of change as the leadership changes in those companies. So that's my little tangent on that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading some of the funny comments. So, um, okay. So, uh, let's go to another question. Let's hit some more, some subjects. If I can find one, I can find them. I just, uh, am in the wrong screen. Here we go. We go back to it. I know I say that out loud and you guys don't know what I'm talking about with other screens and stuff. Cause I have all these screens, but for me, it's just, I'm padding the time. So it's not dead quiet when I'm looking at stuff. All right. Patrick says, Phil advice, please. All right. Uh, I play classic rock and hair metal. I don't have any hair, but I, I know metal. Uh, it says what to want to build a cab to use my Katana head, vintage 30 cream back other, please help. I I'm a, I'm a huge fan of vintage thirties, huge, but I have, I am been a convert over to the cream backs. Um, I currently, I own a bunch of speakers, but the main speakers I use are the cream back, the, the green back and the vintage 30 and slowly the cream backs have overtaken my green backs. The only time I use a green back is if I'm using a classic style amplifier, just cause I think it pairs nicely, right? It's like, it's like this wine pairs nicely with this, this meal, this cabinet, or sorry, this speaker, excuse me, uh, pairs nicely with this amplifier. Um, and, uh, but to me, if you're going to do classic rock hair metal, the V30, here's all I want to tell you. Don't, instead of saying what I think is going to be best for you, let me just tell you what I hear and why I keep using those two particular speakers a lot, the cream back and the V30. The V30 is what I would grab in a cabinet and out of my cabinets, what I grab if I want to hear, feel more air movement and more low end response. Like I want to, you know, jun jun and it just moves, right? I want to feel that, especially at lower volumes. Uh, it does it great at high volumes, but you know, at lower mid volumes, you know, you get to feel a little bit of, of your pant leg flapping, right? <laughs> right. From the air moving on the cabinet. And, uh, I like that. I like the percussiveness of it. I like the fullness and the depth of that. The cream back to me is, doesn't have the bassiness and the fullness of the V30. But man, does it, is it articulate? You can hear a lot of definition, especially if you're running high gains. So I'm going to use this for you, just show you guys, so you understand, um, Patrick, if I was to grab my Saldano amp right now, and I have two identical 112 cabinets, so, so you know, they're identical in every way. In fact, they're, I don't know if you can see them in the shot, but there's a Friedman cab right there. And I have a Friedman 112 right there. They're two identical Friedman cabinets in every way. Um, and one has a V30. Yep. <laughs> one has a cream back. And so, I mean, I can literally a B that same speaker in those two cabinets. And what I would expect is on the V30, the Saldana will sound a little fuller sounding, but I won't hear all the top end like I want to. So I'll kind of adjust that with the presence control. I'll have to adjust the amp to give you more of the top end for the clarity for string separation on big chords on the cream back. I wouldn't get the, the, the kind of like the throbbing bass sound, but I would get all that top end clarity. So you have to figure out, you know, what you, what you want more, especially if you're talking about a 112. So me personally, I, uh, in a bedroom situation and like this in a, in a room situation, I, I prefer the cream backs now, but I think in a, on a, like a room where it would suck up a lot of sound, like a bar or on a stage outside, I would probably go back to the V thirties. Cause again, it just throw more, more low frequencies, which, which, you know, if you're in a bigger room, you, you feel like those go away real fast. So anything to give you those back is kind of nice. Um, I'm going to say Averis. That's my attempt at your name. I hope I didn't mess it up. It says, happy Friday, Phil. It says, how, how long does it take to break in speakers in a new cabinet? 
and will they break in faster at higher volume levels? Um, so I, you know, I did a video. It was very has as I mean, it's not like I'm the only one. Fifty people on the internet did this video a few years back. I was one of them for sure. Um, they got mine got shared on Guitar World, and that's where the thing about. And I was showing people how you break in speakers and why I break in speakers. Uh, if you for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it's when you get a new speaker on a cabinet or even an amplifier. Uh, I run sound through it for 24 hours. That's how long I do it. Um, I find that that softens the cone. Um, the owner of Red Plate Amps told me once that his secret to his broken in speaker sound was he takes a can of WD-40 and he spray WD-40 on the outer part of the cone of the speaker, um, on like a V30 even, and they spray the cone, um, just the edge where, where it flexes and uh, before they ship the amp, you know, in the cabinet. And uh, he says, that's how he does it. Um, so here's what's funny about this, okay? And this is gonna, the, the broken in speaker thing is like, kind of like the tone wood thing. So let me just tell you what's weird about that, that, that theory of breaking in a speaker. Um, there is a, there is obviously, like I said, there's always gonna be a placebo effect, but here is what's funny. In my particular situation where I made that video was because I was using V30s and every time I got a new cabinet with V30s, I felt it sounded harsh and bright to me and it didn't sound like, so, and I mean with the identical cabinet. So like, I think in that video I was using a Mesa cabinet. So I had a Mesa with a V30 and then I got a new Mesa with a V30 when I AB'd the same cabinet, for some reason the new one was brighter. So I, I played music through it for 24 hours. And then when I played them the next day, I could not tell the cabinets apart. What's not in that video, so you know, was after a couple of days, I seriously couldn't remember. I, I would plug into them and I could not hear a distinguish a difference. But for a fact, I could distinguish a difference when I first got it. That's not evidence that breaking in the speaker works. It just means in that situation, that's what happened to me. However, since doing that video, what's funny about that was there was like a Tonewood video. A lot of people were half that were like, this doesn't matter. It's all fake. And the other were like, it definitely works. Every single company I've talked to that builds speakers, whether it's Celestion or Jensen or Eminence, um, behind the scenes with nothing to gain from that, they all believe that breaking in the speakers makes a difference. So, um, you know, take with it what you will. Here's what I tell, tell myself now. Uh, I break in speakers because it doesn't hurt me to do it and it doesn't hurt the speaker and it doesn't hurt anything. And if it does something great and if it doesn't do something great, it's not like, you know, not like if you don't think, you know, like the wood affects tone, which is fine again. Um, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, <laughs> there's not like there's, a, you know, that is different, right? You have, you have to actually believe it or not believe it for you to actually think it, but the speaker breaking in thing. I mean, you could just do it, but to answer your question, I, I find 24 hours is how I do it, but I will tell you, um, I was told by people I trust. I mean, I seriously trust as speaker gurus that two hours is more than enough. And that's probably right. <laughs> and how much volume, um, you don't have to put a ton of volume through it, but put, you know, moderate volume enough to get the, you just want the speaker moving, man. Just get the speaker moving. And I think all you're trying to do is just get the cone to the, the rim of the cone to soften a little bit. So it, so it moves differently. And like I said, I don't really know if there's anything like, you know, any other aspects I think that really matters. I just think that that's what that happens. Um, I was also told by, told by the way, uh, from a bunch of people at different speaker companies that another reason why old speakers sound different than new speakers is the glues they do are different. And the older glues, the way they were made up, ha crystallized and they were harder and that changed the way the cone kind of moved. And uh, I, I always find that stuff gets it really, like now we're dealing with that, like the 1% difference thing. And although I'm sure when you test that stuff, you can hear it, right? I don't know if I give a crap. <laughs> So like I said, breaking in the speakers, just to me, it's about consistency. I just want my speaker to sound like my other speakers, especially when I have the same one. So tone glue. Yeah. Well, think about this glue matters in acoustic guitars. That's a, a fact, right? Like I don't, I don't argue glue matters in electric guitars, but acoustic guitars where the constructed matters. I mean, there's no argument that acoustic guitars, there is no tone argument of acoustic guitars. So I would say if someone told me, just so you know, if somebody said, hey man, using uh, wood glues versus epoxies on building and constructing a cabinet uh, changes the tone of the cabinet. I don't know if I could be a believer on that, I, even if they showed me. <laughs> but a speaker, I think it could be. In fact, because here's, here's why I say that. Here's why I say the glue could matter. 
we definitely know the materials in the speaker. That's all they're doing. A lot of different speakers that sound different are just literally different materials. Same, same design. Sometimes the speaker is different, but sometimes it's the same design, just literally changing the paper on the cones or the depth or just small things. So it's a physically moving thing. I mean, it's not like it's a, it's like a pickup or something. It's not, it's not as, it's not as easy to, to pick apart, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm an old vintage. I'm vintage says, doesn't bad cat get unreinforced cones on their selections to soften them? Yeah. So what happens is, is I, I um, I, I'll tell you what I know, and I tell, and I'll tell you what I think. What I know is it's absolutely true. I'm not old. I'm vintage. Um, what uh, John at Bad Cat does when he orders his V30s from UK, because Bad Cat gets their V30s from UK, um, they order them without the rubber coating on the edge of the speaker. Um, and that's supposed to simulate like a broken in kind of sound. Um, what, why, uh, but, but I think I heard, I think I remember John saying passively to me, not like in an interview or anything, but kind of like, you know, just talking one day, I thought he said, the reason they do that is that the rubber coating was added to V thirties. Like originally the V thirties didn't have the rubber coating, like back, back in the day. And they added that coating on the edge because all the guitar players started playing really low tunings and stuff. And they were blowing cones. And of course, you know, V, you know, Selection doesn't want to have to replace cones under warranty. And so they added that to like strengthen the cone. And, um, and that's why he said he wanted to remove because all of the bad cat amps are 40 Watts and below. So there's no, there's no fear of them blowing the, the 112 like a 50 Watt, hundred Watt amp would do. But so, so I'm just telling you that because the first part is true. He orders them without the rubber coating, but I'm pretty sure I remember him saying that's why he did it. Um, I don't know. I would, I would not remember that incorrectly, but, but just in case I'm, he calls me tomorrow and goes, Hey, that's not what I said. I said this, I'll, I'll clarify next week if it's different, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. So, um, okay. Oh, Steve Wright says, what if you used a V30 and a cream back and a one and a 212 cab? Uh, absolutely. I love that idea. I love mixing speakers and uh, 212 cabinets. Uh, it's amazing. The, um, for a ton of reasons. So using a V30 and a green back or using a cream back and a V30 or cream back and a, and a blue El Ninko speaker, uh, selection, uh, or using a blue El Ninko and a V30, all that stuff, man, sounds great. Th to me, it does exactly what you think. You know, right? One speaker's got maybe got a little more highs, one's got a little lows, and you get this EQ kind of balance out things nice. The other thing that's really nice about that is if you have a 212 with different speakers, one of the advantages in recording um, is that you can mic uh, the speaker you want for a sound. So in other words, if you want the V30 sound, you you mic that V30, and if you want the other speaker, you can you can mic that speaker, or you can mic both and get that, that crossover sound. So we absolutely love that idea. Um, one other cool thing, it's a little fun fact is uh, is that about speaker cabinets like 212s is that if you put like a 75 watt speaker and a 30 watt speaker, the only thing you need to know, right? First of all, you have to match up the ohms. So that's something that's easy. You just download the chart online for whatever you're doing. But when you're picking different wattages, the thing to understand is, is that the lowest wattage is what the speaker, the two speakers will be. So if you put a 75 watt and a 30 watt speaker in a 212 cabinet, your cabinet now will be have a max of 60 watts because both will operate at 30 watts. That's my limited understanding of that. I just remember like a bunch of amp builders telling me that in different versions. Um, that's my understanding. So that's what I've always gone off of. And so what I'm just saying is I don't really, you know, I, I just kind of assume that's the wattage uh, max and then I don't go crazy with that. All right, next, next, next ticket is number 13. Uh, it says, um, this is from Gina. Hi, Gina. It says, happy Friday. Strap button on my SG is placed at the neck joint heel. Yep. I would like to move it where and how to move it upper horn point. A lot of people put them on the upper horn point. They put them on the back of the horn, uh, not the tip. Um, that's how you can do that. Um, I don't do that, but people do that all the time. Obviously, Gina, the only thing you have to understand is once you drill that hole, you know, you're kind of, you're there, <laughs> right? You've made a hole in the guitar. Um, so, um, what I will suggest is, um, is, uh, 
No, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, just uh, sometimes it's nice. If you ever go to resell the guitar, if you ever try to get rid of it and you drill the hole there, one thing you can do is put, uh, make sure both holes have a strap button on it. And then some players will make the decision if that matters to them, but some players do it all the time. But yeah, you can do it. You just do it on the back of it. And there's a ton of, of uh, pictures online you see where people have done them. They pretty much, you just do it where you think it's safe. You don't want to get too close to the tip of that horn because it can damage it. And, you know, but a lot of times that is an improvement on the guitar. Like I said, I haven't done it myself. I haven't had the issue. Uh, I just adjust the strap and it works for me, but, but I understand, I understand as an SG fan, why you'd want to do it. Coop stop says, yo, Phil, will using a two point trim on a strat make the guitar need a setup sooner or does it just make it go out of tune setups, uh, get expensive. The two point trim, was designed as a concept to improve stability and tuning. The idea being, you know, you have two points of contact and they're running on resting on a blade and they're going to be more, uh, it's going to be, it's going to move and return. I guess return is the per, uh, most important word. It's going to return back to where it's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to be, uh, with minimal issues compared to six screws. Um, as you guys know, I've said this before, Paul Ray Smith uses six screws, but they use six screws with uh, bevel cuts in them. And then the blade rests on all six screws. Um, the two point trim should not go out of tune, <laughs> right? The design of that bridge does not, is not a defective design. So uh, Kustop, what I want to tell you is that if you have a two point tremolo on a guitar, like a Strat, like what you're talking about, and it's going out of tune, it is not the design of the bridge. It could be the quality of the materials in the bridge. You could be used, you could have a, a version of the guitar, because I don't, you didn't say what strat you have that has a really horrible bridge. But my experience, even then, even the crappy bridges will, they're usually not the weak link in this. Usually when you use a tremolo, I don't care what it is, whether it's a Bigsby, a Floyd Rose, uh, the two point trim, the six screw trim, uh, whatever you use, the Stability issue of the guitar going out of tune is always, always in order of problems. First the nut, then the tuning keys, then the bridge. The bridge is usually the last culprit uh, in the situation. So if your nut is cut correctly and it's smooth and it's not binding up, and if there's no issues with like string trees uh, that are that are misaligned or just crappy, or your tuning keys aren't uh, having an issue, then like, let me put it this way. If your, your nut is cut correctly or using a lock nut, it's right. And er, there's no string tree issues and your tuning keys are right. It is most likely I'm not going to see your bridge not staying in tune. Especially if you're stretching your strings and doing everything. It's, it's kind of like, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It happens all the time. Bridges are defective and bridges are bad too. But I'm just saying in the, in the things I've repaired over the years, that is usually not the cause of the issue. That is usually what everyone has handed me. Everyone who's ever handed me a guitar for tuning issues with a tremolo always says, hey, my, my bridge won't stay in tune, fix this. And when I fix it, I hand it back to them, they go, it's perfect. And they go, how did you fix the bridge? It's always, I did your nut or I, you know, we changed the tuning keys or, you know what I mean? It's usually not the bridge that we're fixing. Um, um, unless of course, like I said, the bridge has damage or it's just a crappy material bridge. But even then, the crappy bridges, um, a lot of people complain the crappy bridges don't stay in tune. But my experience with crappy bridges is when they first start, they're fine. It's because they're crappy. Crappy meaning the materials are not very good. They're not very strong. They wear and they get little burrs in them and they get little dents in them. And then they have problems returning to, to, the, uh, to the position. So, so there you go. But I will tell you, um, I've made a lot of money repairing guitars uh, onto the, con on the concept of somebody had an issue with the staying in tune and they literally bought a new bridge and then they brought me the guitar with the new bridge in, and they go, okay, I switched out the bridge and it's still not staying in tune. It's trust me, that nut is going to be uh, a, a bastard of a thing. Um, the, that's why the Floyd Rose has a locking nut. That's the first thing Floyd Rose kind of, you know, kind of focused on was, okay, if we lock the nut, in other words, we, we put the strings and we lock them so that they can't, when they move forward, they don't, they, they don't have a problem with. Uh, returning to the wrong spot. Cause that's what's happening by the way. When we say your nuts cut wrong, what's happening is you're loosening the strings, you know, dive bombing the guitar, pushing forward strings, get loose. And then when you stretch them back out, they're not lining up in the same spot in the nut as they were before. And even though you can't see, right? Cause I mean, to the human eye, they probably like, you could take, 
you can take a Sharpie and you could mark like a, on the string right past the nut, just put a little mark and make it really fine. And you could dive bomb, pull it up and you'll see, it looks like an almost line back up. It's that, it's that small minute of a, of a difference. So, so there you go. So, all right. Um, next let's, uh, I want to stay, I, I got some super chats, but I want to stay in the, in the, um, in the chat and see what you guys are talking about. Okay. Um, okay, guys, hold on. Oh, you guys are talking about the, you know, oh, so, um, I'm just catch. I wanted to see what you guys are discussing. The, uh, JG Moore. Oh, Mopar like the parts JG Mopar. I assume it's gotta be, he's gotta be a Chrysler fan, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mopar, uh, JG Mopar is saying the new Marshall pedals are three times more than when they originally came out. So I assume you guys are talking about the fact that Marshall announced that they are reissuing the Marshall pedals that are highly collectible, which is the shred master, the blues master, blues breaker, blues breaker, shred master governor, right? There was another one too, right? The over something drive one. Um, and they're reissuing them to where they look like the original ones in the boxes. Uh, so, oh, okay. So Michael Frizzle says thoughts on the new Marshall pedals. That's the problem I'm having. So you guys know, I saw the announcement that they reissued them. What I didn't see was what do they cost and what, what are they, where are they made? Um, um, they said they are faithful reproductions is what I read on their ad copy, you know, faithful reproductions of the originals. Look, the originals go, uh, for big money. I, I obviously look, I can't be a hypocrite here. I totally, totally love when they, <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to laugh for a second. I do. I love it when companies basically take the thing that everybody goes, Oh, this magical thing. No one can have. And the company goes, here you are. We just recreated it. Like one day I'm like, one day I just want to see them <laughs> make the clon again. And then everybody's $5,000 clons worth like, it, you know, it will actually, you know what? It's dumb. Here's how dumb it is. If, if the guy who made clons just, I know he makes the other clon or whatever. And I, you know, I'm, I'm generally in, informed on the clon stuff. Um, but I mean, if he made a clon and he's like, I got the exact molds, the same exact parts. I found them all in my garage. I didn't know I had them all these years. And he made the exact same clon. And he put it out for $300. People would still be asking crazy money because they would say that the new ones are just never going to be as good as the old ones, even though in most cases, they're minutely different. I'm, I'm using the word minutely a lot today. <laughs> and so same thing with the Marshall ones. I'm sure if Marshall really came at this with a wholehearted attempt to do this right, their reissues are going to be dead on, right? They probably, they probably throughout the years made a couple different versions of those pedals and then they they went and found, bought up some, checked them out, reverse engineered them and made them. And uh, who knows? But the reason I say that is I'm always cautious because some companies do just like to slap old names and designs on new crap and just say, oh, it's the old thing. So we won't know until we try one and hear one. Um, I was always a huge fan of the Shredmaster and of course the Blues Breaker and the Governor. Uh, that's the three I always liked um, out of the four. Um, but... <laughs> But uh, what's funny about this is, like I said, I, I say this all the time. It's like when you buy a vintage reissue guitar that they kind of, they do. Um, you know, I, I have a Gibson R9 and the one thing that's always funny about that guitar is not the discussion you have with guitar players. That guitar's discussion gets really weird and interesting with non-guitar player people. So like if you mention you have, you know, uh, a Murphy Lab or an R9 or some kind of crazy expensive guitar, uh, you know, custom shop reissue of a guitar and they go and they go, Oh, and they know the price tags are crazy, you know, four five, six, seven thousand $7,000. And they go, that's, that's crazy. Is that, you know, right. That's all that seems like a lot. Cause it's a lot of money. And they go, it's a re replica of a, of a real one. And they go, Oh, and they go, real ones go for half a million dollars. And they go like, people don't know how to react to that because there's no logical sense of that. They're like, well, they first say, they go, well, it must not be like it. Right. And I'm like, no, it's kind of like it. I played the real ones and I played this one. I mean, they're, they're close. They're like, that doesn't make any sense. That's like saying Ford re made a reissue of the 65 Mustang and it's 
almost exactly like it, but it's <laughs> it's five percent the cost. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the half a million dollar guitar, you can buy one <laughs> for five thousand dollars, and it's made kind of like the original, right? Um, it's generally made the same way. <laughs> And they don't know how to react to it because it does. It seems crazy. You're like, I don't understand this. And I'm like, I, and I tell them all the time, I go, it's because I think there's a, a fine line. I've always said this before this. There's guitar players. Guitar players like to tell you that they're not collectors, which is just horse shit. And then, um, excuse my language, but it's it's always my pet peeve. You know, that's why I always champion guys like Pete Thorne and people who have, and, 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 and Tim Pierce who have the... They have the guts to tell the truth. Look, they're professional players and they have a couple guitar. Like Pete Thorne has his own signature guitar. Of course, that's a guitar he wants to play. He loves his guitar, but he buys other guitars and he'll tell you, yeah, he wants them. And yeah, he can say in the studio, but sometimes he just wants them, <laughs> right? We, you know, it's like, there's nothing wrong with if you do something for a living and you're also a collector. Um, it's like uh, people who try there, the, this is one of the few industries that, well, I'm sure a lot of them do it, but this is the one of the one that like, they try to put a line between collectors and professionals. And I'm like, well, professionals can be collectors too. Collecting is just something that you, you're just an enthusiast. So you, you like to surround yourself with the thing you love. Um, but here's what's funny about that. Um, <laughs> uh, basically when it comes to these reissues and stuff, um, it, it makes no sense. But what I tell, tell you everybody is that I think there's a line between a collector and a professional. And then there's another line from that, uh, from, uh, memor memorabilia. Okay. And that's what I think certain things fall into. So some things go past collecting. So to me, collecting, like when you collect guitars, to me, someone who collects an R9, who's like, so let's say I'm a Strat guy and I play Strats all the time and I want a Gibson, uh, Les Paul or an R9 or an R7 or whatever, all these custom shop Les Pauls. Um, I'm a collector. I'm just trying to get other types of guitars and maybe there's legitimate reasons because I want different sounds. But but here's what's funny, talking to most most professional guitar players that I've hung out with and, and it, they'll tell you that they tend to use the same kind of guitars over and over again, even in the studio. They, they want a different sound. They just kind of manipulate things to get the different sounds more than they'll so much carry 20 guitars with them. So, but what I find when I see vintage guitars, I find vintage guitar collectors are more into the memorabilia. They're collecting a piece of history, not so much a, 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 a technical piece of a tool because the tool can be achieved by the replica. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I say that because I'm going to get lit up. I know it. Somebody's going to send me an email going, I collect, I have a 64 Strat and there's no Strat that sounds as good as this. Fine. I don't disagree with you because I don't know or care. What I'm just saying is, is that when I see people collecting vintage things, it's usually a piece of memorabilia. I don't see them any differently than when I see people collect, you know, uh, art or, or types of, you know, albums or all other things that are like historical, like an old album or an old book, right? Collecting old things, antiques, they're antique collectors. I look at vintage guitar collectors as antique collectors. That's not a slam against them, by the way, right? Let's be honest. I, it's not my thing. So of course, if I was worth you know crap tons of money and I was gonna buy anything I want, I would buy more guitar stuff because I'm a guitar freak, but I wouldn't buy vintage stuff because it's not my thing. So I'm not gonna say someone who buys vintage stuff, you know, I'm not gonna say anything negative about them because you know, it's their money and I understand why they'd want it. I, I definitely get it. But to me, buying it for the sake of just the tool part of it is, is not the whole equation to me. To me, there's a little bit of, like I said, anti collecting, collecting. So, so there you go. So there you go. Um, and then back to the pedals, basically, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, but like I said, if anyone knows how much they go for, could you put in the comments? I'm curious. Like I said, it's something, uh, you know, me personally, I don't know what the right price on them are. If they're if they're dead replicas and they're really good, I can imagine they'd want three hundred bucks. That's my guess. Let's see how good I do. Three hundred bucks a piece, two ninety nine each. And then I would expect I would imagine that the the one John Mayer uses the brace breaker, brace uh, blues breaker, the blue one, blues breaker, I think, right? That one's going to be the one that sells like crazy. Oh, uh, uh Mopar saying two forty nine for the governor, right? Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's what they were going for, you know, used. That's not more than that. So that seems fair. 250, 250, 250 is good, man. Right. See 250. Um, you know, I, over the years I've owned, uh, a couple of them. I, like I said, I had the governor and I had the full shred and then I had the, 
Blues Breaker. But like I said, I've never tried the other one, the Overdrive one or whatever. So, so it seems seems fair. Two fifty seems legit. I mean, even if they're made, please don't kill me on this. Even if they're made in China, I mean, I don't want them to be. I want them to be made in England because I want them to be made in Marshall's factory. But like I said, if they're replicas, if they're exact of to what you know is out there, you know, it just. I always think about this all the time. Sometimes when companies come out with gear, I feel like I'm pontificating a lot. Um, a lot of com- oh, made uh, made at Marshall. See, totally legit. Two hundred fifty bucks. I'm a buyer. I'd buy one. I don't know which one I'd buy, but I'd buy one. Probably not the Shredmaster, even though that's probably my favorite because it's like a high gain pedal. I have enough high gain tones. I don't need that, but I'd probably get the Blues Breaker. That's probably one I go after. So, um, you know, because it's on John Mayer's pedal board, and obviously I like his tones, but. Um, so that's basically it. <laughs> so it seems pretty cool. But like I said, I always wonder why companies, when they have products like that, that are highly collectible and high, you know, people saw, uh, sought after them, they want them. Why don't they just reissue the damn things? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so it makes sense. The only company would always had trouble with was boss, but boss had a reason for not reissuing stuff. It was against their company philosophy. Uh, I don't know if you know that boss until they did Waza Waza was like, uh, again, this isn't a, like they, they stated this. I'm just telling you how I perceive this. Waza is like the boss, a boss pedals loophole to break their own philosophy. See boss, um, philosophy is never look back. That's like their, that's their, like their corporate mission statement is never look back. So when they would discontinue a pedal for low performance, because that's 99% of the time, if Boss discontinued a pedal, it was because it wasn't performing, right? They Or they discontinued because they made a new one and they thought the new one was going to do better. Um, and then in very few cases, maybe they couldn't get components. But most of the cases, it was just because it wasn't performing. And so later, when people would collect them and they would skyrocket in value, you'd be like, hey, they should reissue it. But their thing was like, never look back. <laughs> so it was against the corporate mantra and they couldn't, they couldn't break it. So I think Waza was the way for them to kind of come at this as like a, this is a different, you know, Waza's different, you know? Uh, and that's how I kind of looked at it when they, I remember sitting in the meeting, uh, first time they introduced Waza at the NAM show in a, like some kind of dealer meeting. And that's the way they were explaining it. I thought it was really interesting. And I never knew that. I, I always thought it was weird. That they didn't reissue stuff. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. I understand. Right. You know, it's against, against your corporate mantra. So, uh, Fast Freddy 33 says, Phil, can you play upright bass? I can fake upright bass. Now, I haven't played an upright bass in probably 10 years, um, but I used to own an upright bass. I, I decided uh, that I needed to play upright bass for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I can, when I say I can fake it, I, I, can, I can hang for, especially like a rockabilly thing, I could probably do a song or two. But I haven't done it in 10 years. So I would have to, you know, I would need it for a day or two to get back into habit. But I could I could get through it, you know, um, at least enough. Like I said, I could go up on stage and at least pull it off enough. Like I said, it's, it's a bass player. I have a bass player mentality more so. And um, as a bass player, you know, it's like that's what you how you think. You're like, can I go up on stage and can I get through a couple songs, you know, with this this much skill set? You know, can I play funk this much? Can I play, you know, jazz this much? You know, it's just a nice. So with upright, same thing. I could get up there and um, I've I've played upright enough ten years ago to where I could I could hang uh, for a song or two. <laughs> I say that because I'll tell you, uh, especially with the rockabilly stuff. Um, even though they change the strings and stuff, that stuff's pretty brutal on your hands, man. That's you know my 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 sensitive hands. <laughs> you gotta get you gotta get back into like. What's the thing? I got to get in fighting condition. I got to get back into playing condition for that. Um, okay. Uh, next, what do we have? Uh, we have um, Warm 5 says, hey, do chambered Les Paul sound different? Are they like 335s? Oh, great question. I would love to tell you <laughs> the answer. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to tell you the answer. Um, you know, a lot of arguments on that too. You want to, you want to talk about, you think the internet fights about tone wood, talk about chambering a guitar. Uh, it's funny to me. It feels like, I always feel like it's 50, 50 on the tone wood fight, right? (laughs) 
Well, there's probably a, a slight winner to that, but it always falls into form 50 50. Um, and by the way, just to call people out for funny this things, I also notice a trend when I'm talking to people about Tonewood that publicly everybody seems to be against Tonewood, and then privately, seem, no one seems to be against it. You know how many times I've been told, I know I say I don't say anything, but I really think tone would works. <laughs> it's like a weird. I'm like, well, then say that publicly. <laughs> but anyways, back to back to uh, uh, tone holes <laughs> is what we'll call uh, weight relieving, right? Tone holes. Do tone holes change the sound? Uh, well, if you don't believe in tone wood, then you probably don't really work. Uh, believe in tone wood or tone holes. Uh, in other words, a weight relief. Um, usually, if you if you're a non-believer of tone wood, you, the only thing that you will uh, consider is that a hollow body, a true hollow body with a um, like a trindle bracing or something that you know you you know that it can compress differently with the bridge, and maybe that has some sonic difference to the strings, and maybe that will translate to the pickup. Um, so that's your thing. So the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm going to answer your question not knowing uh, which side of the tone wood fight you're on. So, Warren, if you don't believe in tone wood, well, then this doesn't even matter to you. So don't trust me. Then no, chamber doesn't matter. <laughs> to you, an E335 and a Gibson Les Paul don't sound different because they're solid in the middle and that's all that really matters because the pickup's getting all the sound. Now, if you do believe that changing the makeup of a guitar, regardless of the pickups, changes the sound, um, a lot of people believe that chambering guitars does change that sound. Do I notice? Here's what I noticed. This is the question I really want to answer for you. Do I notice the difference between a heavy, heavy guitar, like a like a 10-pound, 11-pound Les Paul and a 8-pound Les Paul that's got some chambering in it? I generally will notice a difference. Like, I notice that there's... Um, I always feel like the heavier Les Paul just has a little bit more oomph. Right. And the hollow one seems it has a more a little more mids. But that being said, again, we're talking about percentages so small that I feel like I could correct that with the amp. I'll just reach over and go, you know, um, to me, a difference in tone is something I can't correct. <laughs> right. If I have to pull out a rack EQ to fix what some guitar sounds like, then we have a problem. But to me, if I just go, OK, well, on this guitar, I run the bass on the amp at 12 and now I run the bass at nine. You know, to me, that's not a real enough difference. So to, to me, chamber doesn't really make a difference to me. I would, and I can tell you right now, uh, without any doubt, chambered is the only way I can go with guitars, with both guitars that are heavy. So um, uh, my uh, R9 is not chambered, but I search forever for a light one. And my uh, Les Paul Classic is chambered. That's why it's under eight pounds. It's seven pounds and change. And I'm having a, a Les Paul I shouldn't say that, but I'm going to say Les Paul made right now that is chambered. I can't tell you more than that because I'll jinx it. I always feel like every time I tell you guys about a guitar that's having done for a video or whatever video is coming, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it's like, uh, actually, I'll just tell you, I am 100% convinced that if I mentioned to you guys uh, that I'm ha working with a company to have a guitar built, um, then what happens is, is that the videos because they get so many views they sell a few guitars because you know people get excited because you know just like i watch a video and i get excited and then the company stops working with me because whatever they wanted out of me which is to get you guys to buy some of the guitars they don't want to do it anymore <laughs> that's what i think happens i don't know why but uh it could be but um i could be wrong but i just feel like it because i've had so many companies start to build me a guitar and then never finish it it's getting it's like I said to the point where i won't do it anymore so i'm doing one last time this is one last time. We'll see if this, this guitar comes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, HK says, are they always lighter? A chambered Les Paul. They are lighter in, like, let me put it this way. If you take a, so think about, a, think about just a slab of wood, okay? If we take a slab of wood that weighs five pounds, right? Cause you gotta think about when you're adding all the components, that's how you're gonna get to this, you know, 11, 12 pound monster. If you take a five pound board, right? Or two, two boards that are glued together um, and you weight relieve them, but then on another board, that board's three pounds, you're not gonna be able to relieve two pounds of weight by drilling some holes in it. So believe it or not, <laughs> an unchambered guitar can be lighter than a chambered guitar. 
chambering really came into uh into play if you guys look at like to me uh semi hollow guitars uh like um like like the telecaster and stuff when they started doing the telecasters and they started chambering them and putting the f holes and stuff that's really where i I, if you notice a lot of guitars, a lot of companies, if you go through their history, when they started offering chambered instruments, it's because they were experiencing tons and tons of heavy wood. And the wood has to do, like I said, the wood really, the big factor for the wood is, is that when you cut down a tree, this is one thing to think about, right? Think about it, you cut down, like I, I like ash is a perfect example. That's one of the biggest culprits of this is ash. Um, you could take a piece of a tree, cut it down, and uh, extract some boards from it, um, ash. And depending on the season, the age of the tree, how much moisture was in it at the time when you cut it, um, the, the se you know, drought seasons, seasons um, uh, you know, uh, wet seasons, those boards, oh, also keep in mind that the, the, where the wood was cut from the tree, the top of the tree versus the bottom of the tree, there's different, right? <laughs> it's gonna be different in weight right? There's a lot of variables, okay? And so in other words, you can take a, a board from a tree, an ash board that you're going to use uh, to make a guitar with, and that same blank of wood can be on a size of a guitar, a board for a guitar. It can be two to three pounds different in weight, the same board. So that's why you see guitars. That's why, so you know, um, I always, uh, I put the weight of a guitar in the video, but I hate doing that because that's almost like alluding to some people that don't understand that, that if they buy a guitar that I reviewed that I said was seven and a half pounds, your guitar will be seven and a half pounds. Your, pound, your guitar will be nine pounds. If my guitar is eight pounds on the video, your guitar could be six pounds. So there is variance and different woods are gonna be more, have more variance. And ash is probably the biggest culprit of being so dramatic. Um, alder is very consistent. So usually if you see an alder guitar, it's pretty, pretty consistent. Basswood is also pretty consistent. You're not going to see huge difference in, in basswood as well. Mahogany is also pretty consistent. That's a pretty consistent one. Maple's consistent, but it's consistently heavy. <laughs> it's, a, it's, you know, I mean, it's going to usually all be on the heavier side. So, like I said, um, the, um, uh, my, uh, my bass that I just recently did with Kiesel, it is chambered. And that's why I did it because I asked for mahogany body, mahogany neck. I knew that would be on the lighter side. And then I wanted it chambered. And the reason I did it is because I knew it had two eight, uh, nine volt batteries, you know what I mean? And, and then the bridge, the high mass bridge and all the electronics. I mean, I knew I was adding weight to the guitar. So I said, let's remove some wood to kind of level that out. Yeah, Zach says poplar seems com consistent. It could be, I, I don't... I, you know, the problem with poplar, there's certain woods that I'm just not as versed with and poplar is one because there's certain woods that are really heavy in more price affordable guitars. And although I've put my hands on tons more, I put my hands on more inexpensive guitars than expensive guitars because that's how many, you know, by law of averages, there's more inexpensive guitars than expensive guitars on the market. Um, I've had less to do with, you know, constructing new guitars <laughs> that were inexpensive. So constructing guitars, uh, you know, that are more expensive, you tend to work with the more expensive type of woods. So I can see where poplar could be consistent, but I'm not familiar with it as much. By the way, that's why I like, um, John Sir and Eddie Van Halen love the bass maple combination. That's why I like a basswood body with a maple cap. Me too. Love that as well. I think it's a great way to, to kind of, uh, in my opinion, it's a great way to give you a gorgeous top level out the body weight. In other words, the basswood will be light, the maple's heavy, and it kind of comes into a sweet spot uh, for weight. And um, and that's what it is. So I like it. Uh, Ross, hold on, buddy. Let me drink some water. Ross's uh, com question, comment, subject says, please compare the Amplified Nation to the Bad Cat. Which would you choose if you could only have one amp? So that's not fair because I'm going to tell you the answer now. I don't have to compare it. I will if you want, but um, I don't have to compare them to give you the answer. The Amplified Nation's the better amp, but it's also twice as much. <laughs> uh, look, the Amplified Nation amp, uh, there's a comment on the video uh, and it's perfect. <laughs> it's almost like if I was going to comment on videos, which I usually don't, uh, there would be my comment. It's like, that amp sounds amazing, but for that price, shouldn't it? Absolutely. 
I am in love with the Amplify Nation uh, amphiponics and gain. I, I will tell you, I, I literally cannot believe how close it sounds to my Saldano and then how close it sounds to my Fender and then how close it sounds to my Marshall. It's really impressive how it gets really close to those sounds. And actually, in my opinion, I think it's better than the Saldano. I think it sounds like the Saldano, but it's a little bit crisper and cleaner. I like it just a little bit better. I like it more than the Marshall. One, it sounds just like my Marshalls, but it's got a little bit of reverb. <laughs> and I like that because I usually have to add that. And the Fender, yeah, it's got a Fender, but it's got a little bit more, a uh, little bit more mid highs. So the highs are bright, but they're also not so sharp to your ears. Sharp meaning you kind of don't stab your ear a little bit. So it's great, but it's a price tag that makes uh, it makes sense. What I would say is this: if you ask me right now, and like I said, I'm friends with Taylor and John. These are I love these are fair fights. I like the owners from both those companies, and I respect both of them as to me, just like Dave Freeman. Like I can tell you right now, behind me right now, there are three companies that I will honestly tell you. In fact, I'll just tell you all the names behind me, okay? So I'll tell you where I stand on this stuff. The To me, Dave Freeman, which I have, you know, my twin sister and the small box. You got John at Bad Cat and you got Taylor Cox at Amplified Nation. In my opinion, are three guys that are going to go in history absolutely as being the modern you know, guys, you know, like the versions of basically Leo Fender, uh, Jim Marshall, Mike Saldano. That's who I think they're going to go down as, right? I think they're going to be in that league. Uh, and I don't mean they're better than those guys. I mean that they'll just be mentioned in the same breath as those guys. It's a, that's an impressive thing to do. So they all offer something that's uniquely different. Um, Taylor's business model is different than everybody else's. And it's because he's direct to consumer. He's really throwing a lot of stuff in the amp and he's adding a lot of custom features and he's really kind of got a great ear. And so does John and so does Dave Friedman, right? In fact, Dave Friedman's ear, I think is his strongest and most powerful attribute more than anything. Okay. Um, you know, if I own Marshall amps, I would pay Dave Freeman to shut his company down and run Marshall R and D. That's what I would do tomorrow. <laughs> That's why Marshall would not hire hire me because I would because I'm sure it would be insane. I because you'd have to offer Dave more than he ever could make at Friedman and and make him the CEO of Marshall basically. But you know right or maybe just head R D. But either way, and he probably wouldn't do it either way. So, but but he, what he's doing is what Marshall should be doing. And so you know, I was drunk once. And I told Dave uh, Friedman that uh, Marshall is one amp away from putting him as, out of business. This is a true story. <laughs> and so, you know, I wasn't drunk. I know I probably just said that. I had a big beer in Germany, so I was forthcoming. And I told Dave, uh, and he probably don't remember. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, Marshall's one amp away from putting you out of business. All they got to do is figure out that they should be doing what you're doing and you're gone. No one will buy your amps. They'll buy Marshall's. And, uh, and then I said... So, you know, so I'm not just an ass. I said, and thank God they don't think to do that. They're going to make iPhone covers. I mean, at least they're making pedals now, but they're going to make iPhone covers and Bluetooth speakers. And that's what their focus is while you're building the amp they should be building. So I know I've gotten a little dis, uh, little off subject. So let me get back to the Amplified Nation bad cat thing. Um, to me, if you have $3,500 to throw down on the Amplified Nation, I, I, could, I could tell you this. I can't recommend it enough. It's a lot of money and, um, and, uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, it's great. And one of the things I've told you guys many times before, if I didn't buy a piece of gear, I can't tell you it's a good deal, right? I can't, uh, testify to the, the price. Here's what I can tell you about the Amphonics game. Okay. Taylor sent it to me. It's never going back. <laughs> if he asks for it back, I'm going to be like, I, I have to keep it. <laughs> Okay, so whatever we do to make that arrangement, uh, it, it's, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm keeping it, so, you know, but I'm just saying, I just like it that much. And I had no idea. Like I said, I kind of went into it blind. Now, here's why this is important. So if you got $3,500 and you want to go for it, I think you should go for it. It's a great amp. Um, unlike me, where you have a bunch of amps, uh, if I could, I could tell you, honestly, I could just go to one amp, it would probably be the amp. Now, that being said, for almost half the price, Okay, because it's really it's two grand versus thirty five. These are both crazy expensive amps. The Bad Cat at half the price. If you got the Bad Cat, you would not be longing for the Amplified Nation. It's not like you would play the Bad Cat every day and frown. Hmm, <laughs> not the Amplified Nation. 
right? <laughs> you would, it's a great amp, right? It's a great amp. And, uh, but it's like I said, it's half the price. So there's just a little bit of things that I think the Amplified Nation does because he's, he's throwing a little bit more money at the problem, right? And that's just it. And same thing with the, the Friedman amp. You know, the Amplified Nation needs a little bit more money at, at, the, at the price point he's at. He can he can do it. Now, here's the thing I'm going to finish with so you guys know. As all the amps I reviewed all the years and all the amps I have, I still think the Ingle Fireball for $1,300, when I think I reviewed it was eleven or $1,200 for $1,300, this amp's not gone. It's still here. I'm not getting rid of it. I was playing it today. That's why it's sitting there. <laughs> I wasn't making a video with it today. I was just playing with it. You know what I was doing? I was curious myself. It's been a few weeks since I pulled it out and played it. I pulled it up, ran through the same cabinets and A-beat it against some of the amps I have here. And I will tell you, it holds up very well. It is not, in my opinion, as good as the Amplified Nation. It is not as good as the Bad Cat, but it is half the price of the Bad Cat. Almost. So, the angle, right? That's why I tell everybody. Oh, and by the way, I still think the Supersonic holds up, especially if you buy a used one, because... I don't think Fender's in a good place right now, <laughs> but that that one, which by the way, I think this one's slightly more. I think this is a hundred bucks more than the Engel, but uh, I think they're all really great amps for the price. Like I said, they're really, really, really good amps. Um, I would have real reason to keep them if I if I didn't really like them. Uh, like I said, that's there's no um, there's no uh, like I'm not you know I don't work for Engel. There's no incentive for me to keep this amp, so I just like it, and and. Uh, and it's amazing to me that we live in a time where amps sound great for $500. It's, they're amazing. And so, you know, you have to decide for yourself if the $500 amp, that sounds good. Because we're not, we're not talking about amps that don't sound good. And then, you know, if you get the money, you can get good tone. Good tone. Good tone's available in a pedal now. Good tone's available in an interface now. Good, it's a software for $130. Bucks. I, I, have, I have Amplitude. I have both... What's the two uh, ones? I have Amplitude and I have the other one. Both of those software programs sound great. Um, but as you get these more boutique amps, there's just a little bit more things happening. It gets a little bit more complex sounding in your ears. It's just a little bit, just a little bit better. There, it is better. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a bad word to say. It just gets better. But there is a uh, diminishing return. You know. I mean, uh, the the this is the best amp out of all the amps I have. But it's like, I don't know. I, I have to make up a number probably for the illustration purposes. This is 5% better than the Bad Cat, <laughs> which is not a lot percent better, but it's better. And, you know, if you have the opportunity to get your hands on one and it's better, you take it. That's that's how it works. That's, uh, that's, that's my that. Brian says he's not selling his Freebuns. I'm not going to sell my Freebuns. I still like my Freebuns. I've been trying, so you know, trying to get rid of one of them, though. I've been trying to get... <laughs> I'm down to the twin sister and the small box. I just want one Freedman, <laughs> right? And I don't know what it is. I like them both. <laughs> and they're just slightly just that much different. To try to figure out which one goes. But, um, which is a testimony again to Dave, his quality stuff. These guys are great. These guys have done what very few companies have done in the world, which is they've made product that really stands out from the the big guys. And and like I said, this isn't to slam Marshall and Fender. I mean, I have them too. They're great too. But I will say, Marshall and Fender to me, Fender is a price point thing. I think they make some of the best amps for the price. You can't you can't really take that away from them. That's what they kind of, you know, in the more expensive price points. They they really are the most affordable, expensive price point. Um but that being said, Marshall and Fender, especially Marshall to me, and I've said this before, Marshall is a nostalgia thing for me. It's just owning a Marshall is like, it was just the thing that, you know, I spent, I didn't own a Marshall until I was 36. <laughs> right? I couldn't own a Marshall, right? I mean, you guys, I told you the story about how I tried to buy a Marshall when I was 18. I bought a crate. So like I said, it's, it's, you know, and so owning a Marshall to me, um, yeah, actually, I can tell you exactly what it's like for me again. I mean, no offense to anybody in these stories, but, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted a Cadillac, you know, I mean, my grandfather had a, a Cadillac Baritz. Uh, if you guys don't know what that is, I don't know what it is. It's an Eldorado Baritz. So it had Vogue tires, which had both white walls and the gold thing on it. And it had, it was fancy. I think it had a gold Cadillac logo. Um, 
like it was a big deal, right? That he had this car and you know, and people who had money had Cadillacs. So you're like, well, if I ever get rich one day and if I ever can afford a Cadillac, I have a Cadillac. And the reality is, uh, you know, I don't own a Cadillac, but they've kind of like Marshall, I think they're kind of like great, but also there's other things now to get. So, but I can't own a Marshall, so I own a Marshall, <laughs> even though I'm pointing the wrong way. Yeah, Grumpy, Grumpy, <laughs> Grumpy Diggins says, I take an Amplified Nation over a Dumble Price. That's the other thing, too. The Amplified Nation, uh, the uh, Overdrive Reverb, is another thing when I talk to non guitar players. They're like, you know, you they go, same thing as the R9. They're like, that's an expensive amp. And I go, yeah, it's model after an amp's like 50 grand. And they're like, so it's not very good compared to the real one, huh? And I go, I don't know. They're probably the same. <laughs> So, uh, Boston guitar says, what are your t thoughts on Sierra tone amps? I hear nothing but great things about Sierra tone amps, people. I trust people I like. Uh, so it's not just like random, you know, cause sometimes, you know, there's just comments or people say things that they are good and you don't know, you don't have a, a source of what they like. Um, one thing I like about YouTube videos is it's not about like their resume, uh, you know, listen to me. Cause I know what I'm talking about. The reality is this, one thing that you can take solace in is that when I'm telling you I like an amp like the Amplified Nation, it doesn't mean that it's great. It just means that it's sitting next to some pretty impressive friends. And so obviously you understand I have the ability to compare some things, so I'm not just saying things. So my friends that actually like the the people I, I know that, that talk highly of Sierra Tone own kind of amps that you would think that, you know, would let allude that they, they know what they're talking about. So in other words, so I hear great things about Sierra tone, but I have no way to get my hands on one. Sean says the issue with Sierra tone amps is you have to import them yourself unless you go through a dealer. Yeah. I don't know much about them. Like I said, I just, the stuff I hear the, um, the, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so like I said, maybe one day, I mean, obviously if I can, you know, if we can get on the channel, I love sharing the Supro amps. I love sharing anything. I got another amp coming up soon video. I, I like sharing stuff. It's, it's cool. And like I said, sometimes I share it and I make the video and I, sh you know, share my thoughts on it and give you some sound samples and go on my way. And sometimes I'm like, okay, this one's got to stay. So, and it's tough. Cause like I told you, something's got to go. If something stays. The co collection does not grow. Okay. All right. Uh, Chuck Miller did a super chat. Thank you, buddy. Mr. S, Mr. S says, please do a video on your wife. <laughs> okay. It would be interesting to hear her take on know your gear things. All the best from San Diego. That'll never happen. This is, uh, this is, um, the fact that she's helping me now do all this stuff and, and with the patrons helping the patron stuff and handling the merch and doing Instagram. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of feel weird right now because I don't usually talk to you guys about anything that I haven't discussed with her pre, you know, previously. Um, I, I don't know this is the answer. I'm just going to tell you what I thought and I haven't told her this. So she's going to hear it first time probably like you guys are. Um, I think she thinks, I think she saw that I was getting a little overwhelmed with the workload. And, uh, I think she decided like, Hey, I'm gonna, you know, cause we already had an understanding that this was kind of my project, this YouTube thing. And this is not her bag, right? But obviously, uh, and by the way, so, you know, I, I asked for help too, but I mean, I think she saw that I was, I was literally, I felt like I was drowning in the workload. And, um, and so she's like, okay. And she's made, she's made my life amazing, uh, taking over some of the things she's taken over and doing for me. Cause, uh, I'll be honest, they would have never got done. But that being said, she's not interested on being on YouTube. <laughs> and the reason is, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, she worked at the store, the guitar store for almost 13 years. Um, there are 1100 people here. I think is what I see. I don't know. So a thousand people here. Uh, oh, 1200, there's 1200 people here. I would say statistically probably two, 300 of you are old customers in my store of our store. So they know my wife, <laughs> they, they, you know, <laughs> um, we went out last night and saw a band and went to a pinball, um, arcade. Uh, with a good friend who's one of, again, is just a customer of our store. We know him from the years and, and my wife and I went with him and his friend and we all just hung out. And, um, 
So you got to understand, she's had her fill of guitars. <laughs> 13 years in the guitar store, she's she's seen and done it all. So she's not really interested in more, right? That was one of the one of the things that, you know, kind of... So that's what happened. We talked about, and she did agree to, I just haven't done it. She agreed to do a podcast audio version. Um, and the main reason is, and I'm just going to tell you, the main reason is that she's that she's not really interested in it is she's is um she already wherever we go (laughs) usually there's we bump into somebody about every two or three trips out of the house we bump into somebody from the store and they're you know and that's great and she loves that you know she's like oh especially the the kids that are i mean we have kids that went to our store i remember 13 years we had a lesson academy we have kids kids i i Look at this. We walked into a bar one time. This is a true story. I should tell, I shouldn't tell the story, but I'm gonna tell the story. We walked into a bar one night and my wife saw one of the students and she walked up and she's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm 22. (laughs) And she's like, oh, why? You know, and then she, you know, she's like, and she wasn't rude, by the way. She was like, you know, kind of like, you know, Cause she didn't say like, did your parents know you're here? She's just like, what are you, you know, in a bar, what are you doing? She's thinking like, maybe he's, you know, 17, right? Because think about this. He probably started lessons with us at, I'm no exaggeration at like 12. So she was a little shocked. She's like, you know, time goes by just like with our kids. So, um, so like I said, she's not interested in having more people from YouTube stop her in places, but she did agree to do a podcast, audio only podcast. So if, if you, it, what's great is you won't have to, you don't have to subscribe to the podcast. You don't have to do anything. It won't be on YouTube, but I tell you what's great is, is that it will be, um, officially posted and I'll announce it uh, here. So if you're watching this show, I'll tell you when she does it that week and, and you'll be able to click the, uh, know your gear podcast.com and get, go right to the link. And so none of you will miss out. Um, what we're doing is, uh, by the way, the reason to do the podcast is she, she understands that there's some questions, believe it or not, that she thinks you guys have that she might be able to give insight into like how does she deal with this craziness or whatever it is so she she'll be involved for that because she she doesn't want to she doesn't want to deprive anyone of information she thinks might be valuable to you guys especially insight to me knowing she's known me since i was 13 years old but you know like i said she's not interested in being a, a person a youtube personality by the way so you guys know ralph's been on the show a few times he's not interested in being a youtube personality either <laughs> so you know he'll he'll pop on sometimes but that's his main thing too he's they they um we're you know remember i accidentally ended up on youtube it wasn't like i'm gonna be a youtube person i just started making videos you guys start watching so to me it's a weird thing so to them they're like me this is not something they thought would happen to me and they definitely don't want it to happen to them i guess um i'm not old i'm vintage says horror stories from the guitar shop she'll probably tell you some <laughs> uh like i said she won't just like me she won't say anything disparaging about a customer um because like i said uh you know we even though we don't have the store anymore there were still people who who fed our children so if you notice i'm very uh very very adamant about i won't at least I try not to do anything to ever shame or harm or ups, uh, upset anyone who ever literally fed my children, paid my electric bill. Okay. So that's our philosophy on that. But there are people who didn't really, <laughs> right. They weren't customers. Like maybe the time we got a gun pulled on us in the store, she might tell you that story that happened. She has an interesting take on that. <laughs> it's a story. And uh, obviously that guy wasn't a customer. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, okay. Let's get, uh, let's get, um, let's get to the next subject. Um, and I can't find it. All oh, right, here it is. I have it right here. Um, Jay wants to know any recommendations for a good classic rock eighties metal sound home guitar amp for $800. Currently using a Boss Katana 50 and looking for a possible upgrade. Sure, Boss Katana is a great amp. So, you know, obviously, you know, there's a reason why they're everywhere. They are very good. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to upgrade a little bit, you know what I would suggest for 800 bucks? I, I'll give you my faves for, for what you said for metal. Definitely the MT-15 by Paul Reed Smith. Only downfall is it's a little hard to get it quiet. You know, so you have to kind of use the effects loop and use some kind of thing. I don't know why a 15 watt amp can't get quiet enough at bedroom volumes, but 
if you're used to the katana where you can just turn it down to whisper and then turn it up a little bit and then get a little louder the mt15 by prs is a little bit like it's touchy it's like it's like one of those like i i think it has a linear potentiometer and i think it's a problem so in other words it just kind of jumps right so it's like quiet and then loud but that one i like the 5150 lunchbox series fantastic amplifiers under $800, you would totally do great. Now, $800, remember, your $800 spends everywhere. It's not like a gift card, right? So you could go used and you could go with a 5150 50 watt head. That is a three channel amp and it sounds perfect, amazing. And as you guys know, I did a video comparing it to my Saldano. And I will say what I said in that video, which is in, everybody was like, everybody loved the Saldano more, which is, makes sense, but the Saldano is almost $3,000. That amp you could buy used for about 800 bucks, and I would say it holds its own against a $3,000 Sedano. In other words, close enough. Um, now, another one great one is, believe it or not, is the PV6505 uh, mini head. I like that head a lot. It's got a lot of gain. Um, it's it's uh, got some reverb built into it, which is nice digital. It's got a line out so you can record with it. Fantastic little amplifier. Uh, great amp, you know. Uh, I, I bought one. The problem was I bought one of their first runs and it had a humming issue. And then I, but I've since played it, you know, a new one and I didn't hear the humming issue. So that's another great amp. Um, I'm trying to think what else, I mean, there's a lot of great amps. And of course the, you know, there's tons, you know, you go to sweetwater.com and look under that price point. You're going to get lots of, lots of great amps, but, um, but those are just ones that I've played. Some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the people here on the chat are saying Black Star. I like the Black Star stuff too. I prefer the amps I suggest you over some Black Star stuff. But again, I'm a fan of Black Star. Black Star gets a lot of hate because uh, you know a lot of people say that they're cheap components and they don't share the schematics. These are all true. <laughs> Everything that people are saying is true. But they're also true about Behringer and a lot of other products too. Um, uh, to me, Black Star is uh, it's priced accordingly in, in most cases. So my concern with Black Star is the same concern that I say about Behringer and stuff like that. Look, it's good for the money if you're buying it at the right price. If you can buy a legitimate, more legitimate amplifier for the same price or a little bit more, you never regret buying a little bit more quality. In my experience, right? It's like, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the saying? I'm I'm, I'm mess it up already. It's a uh, buy right or buy twice or something like that. <laughs> so same thing, you know, a little bit more quality and you get you get a lot for your money. So those are some suggestions I give you. Um, and then, like I said, there are tons others, but those ones all I've owned and I've done reviews on and I still hold. This is the important part. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't come up very often, but every once in a while you know, it comes up, I've reviewed this product and you guys ask me and it's been three years and I go, hey, you know, I don't know if I like it as much as I did three years ago. You know, now the world has changed or the products uh, that out there competing have changed. But those products I just all mentioned to me are all products I would gladly play through and be happy with. So. Okay. Um. All right. I don't know how to say his name, so I'll just do do the question. Uh, I think it's... I don't know. I'm just going to mess it up, man. I don't want to mess it up. But he's got a cool dog avatar. So if you have a cool husky dog avatar, this is for you. It says, hey, Phil. Hope you're doing great. Any experience with Lawler pickups? I've been eyeing their P90s and a wide range uh, Confi pickup. I think that's how you say it. Confi style pickup. Much love from the Philippines. Um, the... Um, Yes, Lawler. I have a Lawler. Uh, it, actually, I have a Lawler P90 in the bridge of that guitar right there. Absolutely love them. I like Lawler pickups. I don't think there's a a bad pickup. There's nothing like for me to go, ah, that's one I don't like. There's some brands where I like most of their stuff, and there's a couple things I don't like, but Lawler's not one of them. I think everything kind of is, is great. Um, I have never tried his wide range Confi pickup, so I don't know. And to be honest with you, I'm not a experienced wide range confi pickup person. I've, uh, you know, I've played a few. I've never dissected one to see what's in it. I think Dylan talks tone has a version of it where he can, he can take and, and, um, take like the squire version and correct it and fix it. And 
And um, you gotta understand, like, there's that's work, you know, what he's doing. He's, you know, he's he's really kind of spent some time dissecting it. As you guys know, I've ripped apart a lot, a lot of pickups. So you gotta, you know, you kind of tend to. I tend to do probably what he does, and a lot of people do, which is you tend to find things you like and then try to learn everything about them. And that's not a pickup that I dislike. It's just not a pickup that's ever been like something I need to know everything about. So I'm not really versed in that. So what I can tell you is I would check out his channel, uh, the Dylan Talks Tone channel about that specific, uh, specific pickup. In fact, I'm sure to sure if you use Confi and just type Dylan Talks and then Confi in YouTube, his, his stuff will come up and you can see about it. I, I actually watched a couple of his videos about that to even verse myself in it a little bit more. Cause like I said, I just know enough about it. Um, because especially with pickups and stuff like that, I try to, I try to be versed in as much things as I can. Cause I love this subject, but there's a difference between, I know, and I know enough to be dangerous, so to speak, right? That's the old saying, you know, it's enough to be dangerous. I'm, I'm just, I know enough about that pickup to be dangerous. I can give you basic information, but I can't give you anything out more than that. But the P nineties from Lawler totally recommend them. I use them. Uh, scent of a wheelchair pillow. <laughs> Still the weirdest name. Uh, what do you think of a Fender Vibroverb 210's reissue from the 1990s? Any experience uh, looking at one local here? I love the Vibroverb uh, 210 combos. I love the way 210 combo fenders uh, uh, sound. Um, mainly, I never owned a lot of them. I only owned a couple. Uh, I had a Vibroverb 68 reissue 210. I don't have it anymore. I love that amp. Um, and the only reason I got rid of it is, is because <laughs> the thing about 210 combos is the same thing with problem with 410 combos for me is that when you go to take it somewhere, it weighs more than the 112 because there's, you know, there's two smaller magnets than a 112, but there's two of them and therefore there's heavier. So 210s tend to be heavier than 112s. 410s are definitely higher, heavier than four or 212s. And so it's a weight thing. So, I mean, I just didn't want to take it places, but I love the amps and I like the punchiness of the tens. Tens do something that I just like, especially with clean. Uh, that just sounds really good. They kind of address the, the lower, the upper mid range frequencies a little better for me. Like when you strum chords, like, you know, you don't get, like I said, I'm looking for anything. that doesn't give me that V just, I don't want to go from bass to treble. I want to sit there and kind of be more flat. I like the EQ flattened out a little bit. I like to feel everything kind of happening at once. So that's a great pickup. Um, and the nineties ones, I think were good era ones. So, I mean, if you're getting it for a good price and you feel pretty safe with it, pretty cool. Retro razor says you can only keep one guitar forever. Must be versatile to cover all genres. Price doesn't matter. Which guitar would you pick? No custom builds. I would pick the Delos by Kiesel. Um, uh, here's why. I mean, I could say I take my copper strat as well, since the Delos is a, literally a copy of that, <laughs> like copy, meaning I spec'd it the same way. Duh. So to answer your question, to me, you, you, your question is very specific in a lot of ways you're not even saying. So you said you can only keep one guitar forever, whatever that means, you know, okay, fine. We're locked in that, but it must be versatile enough to care, care, cover all genres. To me, if I only have one guitar, there's more. So, so this is how I'm going to answer this question that might be helpful. Um, and, and think about it this way. If I can only have one guitar, it has to, it has to tick a bunch of boxes. One, it has to be like a Strat style guitar. Here's why, because I only have one guitar. I can't afford for the break headstock to break. I can't afford for it to be damaged. So I want a guitar when I put it in a case and I travel with it, it'll just take a crap ton of abuse. So to me, if you got a maple neck with no glue joints, not that scarf joints are bad, they're actually really good, but I'm talking about no no um, angle, no angle on the headstock, right? Just, you got basically a straight style neck or a maple neck, it could take a lot of abuse. You're not gonna see a whole lot of broken headstocks on maple neck guitars. It's not very common. So again, alder body, Strat style guitar. This is something, again, if the strap comes off one day and hits the ground, I'm not like, oh, I have no guitar. Cause remember, if you're talking about one guitar, I can't afford to not have a guitar, right? Uh, whatever I'm doing. So to me, durability becomes paramount. <laughs> you know, I need a guitar. I can take abuse. There's a reason why when I went to Germany and when I travel, there's a reason why I just had that, that Vader bass made by Kiesel. I need a bass that I can, the part of the Kiesel 30 inch scale bass for me was I want to put it in a really hard foam gig bag and take it on a plane. But if the plane says, Hey, there's no room and we're going to check it at the, at the gate and put it on the plane, I got to feel like, okay, this will be safe because this thing can take a beating, right? Cause there's no headstock to snap off. You know, it's a pretty durable instrument. 
it's uh, shorter scale, so it's less flexing can happen with people, you know, stepping on it and putting heavy furniture or uh, luggage on it. So durability is a, a big factor for me. So think about this. I'm a huge SG fan, as you guys know. I love SGs, but if I can only have one guitar, it can't be my SG because I'd be in fear all the time. Uh, and it's not even founded in anything. I can't tell you for sure it would actually snap. I'm not trying to do the whole Gibson next step off, but I'm just saying... I wouldn't want to be thinking about that. I want to be thinking it takes abuse. So the first thing is the guitar take up boost. So that means it's a strap for me or a telly. That's exactly what it's going to be. Then one guitar and I only got one guitar. Like you said, it's got a couple of sounds. Well, to me, it's easier for me to get a humbucker coil split to sound like a single coil than it is to get a single coil to sound like a humbucker. You can get single coils to sound pretty fat and pretty huge, but also, you know, you want noiseless because you don't know if you're going to be in a bad situation. You don't know, you know, right? If you're going to have radio signals coming through your guitar. You don't know if you're going to have a lot of 60 cycle hum coming through a, lo a loud amp because you don't know what's going on. So again, to me, a safe bet would be humbuckers. Again, this is a safe bet. And I feel like I could get those fuller sounding guitars. And with a coil split, I'll, I'll be able to fake the single coil stuff. Um, I'd almost want to say I'd want a hardtail guitar. But I'm okay with the tremolo on that type of guitar, uh, the Delos or the Strat, where I put the bridge against the body, and that way I don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's pretty uh, good. But the other reason I said the Delos was because it's got stainless steel frets. So again, so you know, I don't prefer stainless steel frets. It's not a sonic thing for me. Uh, you know, some people say stainless steel sound brighter. I think they do too sound brighter, but sometimes I don't know if that's just in my head, if it's the style, style of guitar. But argumentatively, I just want to keep it easy. Again, durability is paramount to me. So stainless steel frets, hard neck, it's harder to crack the neck, a uh, hard body. Again, uh, you know, and a guitar, and again, it'd have to be a guitar that I've owned already for some time. So I'm familiar with what it will do in environment changes. So I want to know uh, if it, it uh, so here's what I will tell you. My Copper Strat, although I love it, has had fret sprout twice in its 10 year lifespan with me. So it's been with me for almost 10 years. I bought it in 2013. So it's, no, I bought it in 2007. It's 2007. <laughs> okay, so I've had the copper strap for a long time. So over those years, it's fret sprouted one time bad and then one time light. The Kiesel has never fret sprouted. I've had it for, I don't think quite two years now, but coming on it, but it's again, it's not ha having ish issues and I don't do anything to humidify the room. So again, taking abuse that way, um, and uh, so what's funny is, is as much as I like my Kiesel guitar, I want you to understand this is not so much a Kiesel makes the best guitars and go buy a Kiesel commercial. This is a that guitar out of all my guitars, the way, it, way it's handled itself and the way it sounds. And I've done a ton of demos with it. So I've been able to pull off exactly what you're talking about. I've pulled off different sounds with a, a demo video. So I that's the guitar for me. But obviously, uh, sometimes that question's more curious about like, you know, what in my collection would I pick? It's that's kind of be what I pick, but also keep in mind, it's those criteria that I'm looking for. So same thing I would recommend to somebody else. These are the same things I'd recommend to anybody, by the way, if they came to me and said, Hey, I can only have one guitar. What would you recommend? I would recommend a telly or strat of some kind with again, like that GNL over there, hardtail bridge, two humbuckers, maple neck again. Um, but the stainless steel would be nicer because you don't have to worry about replacing the frets. Um, I have not seen everything. I'm just, uh, you know, a lowly guitar tech for many years. So, uh, you know, you can't see it at all, but I've never had, to, had or ever seen a refretted, a stainless steel guitar. In other words, I've never seen anybody wear stainless steel frets out and have to refret them. That doesn't mean they don't. They just, it just means I haven't seen it and it's not likely. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Hero Glop. Hero Glop says, whom would you recommend the Supro Amulet to? Kind of player, price range style. Well, price range, you got to, I think to me, you know, it's a thousand dollar guitar, or amp, guitar amp, right? So a thousand dollar plus amp, it's expensive. To me, now you're in the expensive amp zone. So it's for someone who's obviously not looking to stay within a budget, you know, it's got, got some cash to spend. Um, and by the way, that has nothing to do with how much money you have. It's again, your budget, you have a budget. Everybody wants to spend what they feel comfortable with or what they want. Um, and so something like that would be first taken into consideration. The second thing is it's a great sounding amp. I absolutely love it. And it does, but it's not super versatile, right? You could run pedals through it. Hold on. As I'm 
pouring the water right next to the microphone. I apologize, but it's time to refill the cup. You can't talk for an hour and a half straight and not need liquids. So, um, to me, the amulet, you know, um, I, I wanted to review that amp really bad, as you guys know, because, um, I was a fan of the original one they did and, uh, which was under a different name and that was a comment. So it was different than the comment. And I like it better than the comment. And I really like the comment. Um, but to me, that's like that. It's an old sound. It's got that old sound that I love. You know, it's not like modern amps where they sound fuller. It's like, it's like listening to old mono recordings of the Beatles. That's what the amulet is to me. It's like, to me, the amulet, you know, to me, I'm just going to talk about the vibe of it. That's all I really can tell you. I can't tell you who it's for, but I can tell you what the vibe is. It's like I said, it's like when I got... My, my, my friend's a DJ and he gave me all the Beatles recordings in mono and I listened to them and it's, it's the same thing with the amulet. You plug into it and you go, this isn't the new sound. This is just, it takes me back. It's like a time machine that takes you back in its sound and, it, and it's great. So, and sometimes that's all people want, right? That's all people want is a classic sound. Not, not everybody wants a new modern sounding amplifier. So, and I also like how the clean is really just mid rangey and, and, uh, like where my Princeton is a little bit more scooped out and sound that was a little bit more punchy and sounded better to me. Okay. Hold on a second. <laughs> I don't remember. Hold on a second. All right. How are we doing? We're doing okay, I think. Um. <laughs> okay. Warm Faust. I got this question now probably 50 times on the channel. And what's great is there's so many episodes. There's probably no way for you to go figure out all the different answers I've given to this question. And I've definitely given a different answer to the question. And I'm going to tell you the same answer first after I say the question. I'm going to tell you the same thing. The answer is it's obviously the answer is right now, right? So Warm Faust, Warm Faust, I maybe Faust. Warm Faust says, your house is on fire. Family is safe. Which guitar do you rescue? Uh, it would be the one Nathan made for me, the PRS Nathan made for me. That's that's a very sentimental guitar. I I I would I would not want to tell Nathan that that's <laughs> I brought my strat. <laughs> hey Nathan, I grabbed my you know, right, I got him the Dane Electro, <laughs> right? Um, so that that's probably what I would do. Cause you gotta understand, uh I wouldn't be thinking, well, in that scenario, I understand what you're trying to say. If you only have one of my guitars and grab it and go. Here's the thing. Um, I wouldn't be thinking like I told you earlier about the, hey, I only can have one guitar and it needs to be versatile. It needs to be you know durable and stuff. I'd be thinking, what guitar can't I replace? And I don't think I could replace that guitar. Um, the story behind it is insane. What he did was insane. Uh, insane in a great way, of course. And if you, so most of you have seen the video, obviously it's got a lot of views, but if you haven't seen the video where Nathan uh, basically took two years building, uh, modifying a PRS and building it for me basically with, so a bunch of PRS employees on the down low without me knowing for two years. It's a pretty crazy story. I, I, I find I have trouble just telling it to people when you tell people, you know, it's like, it's an emotional story and it's just crazy. People are like, that's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, so that'd be it. Um, so there you go. Uh, Steve Smith says geeky stuff hats. My wife has found the hats, had the hats made. Um, in fact, unfortunately the new, company she's talking to, which she seems to really like. And I, I think I'm really excited about, she had ordered the hats before she knew about this company. Um, so that's good and bad, but mostly it's good because it's on its way. Um, so I think, uh, what I heard her say was she ordered 50 geeky stuff hats and we'll make an announcement and I want to make a package with them. Right. Cause you know, you got to make this make sense financially for shipping and stuff. Right. So I'll probably do a pack, a hat package, you know, with some picks and stickers and stuff. And we'll put some together. We'll have some hats or something, but I'll, I'll let you guys know as soon as they get here. Okay. All right. 
Hold on one second. Let me do one last thing. Let me do this. And okay, burning sensation. I think a wicked sensation, but I understand. Uh, is forty two hundred a good price for a PRS private stock? Didn't we already get this question before? I feel like this is a question we've answered before. McCarty in excellent condition. I'm not sure how much these things depreciate and how much is reasonable. Well, you know, they depreciate pretty bad. I mean, custom shop guitars uh, don't really hold value uh, all the time. You gotta understand, one of the things that artificially inflates the value of a guitar is that the companies are raising the price of the new ones all the time. So like a lot of times people will talk about resale value, but they forget. This to me is generally, it's interestingly different. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this market, the guitar market is that one of the things that can really inflate the used market is obviously availability, but also a big thing is, like I said, they just keep jacking up the price of the new ones, <laughs> right? So if you bought it for uh, uh, 800 bucks and then the company's, you know, selling it now for 1200 bucks, I mean, you wouldn't sell yours, you, you know, used for uh, $600. Does not make sense? It's not half. So now you'd get your 800 bucks back and that happens all the time. So, um, so that's, that's part of that. Um, so, but for private stocks, the problem is, is high end guitars, the prices don't move as fast. You know, that's in your top tier pricing. When you're in top tier pricing, that usually inflates at the slowest rate. Uh, it, it's just because like I said, there's only so much people are going to pay for something. And it's a small market. You know, if you looked at it like a pyramid of buyers for the guitar market, um, it's a, you know, it's, it's like the high end amp market and the high end guitar market. Once you're in the highest tier of that market, you're in the smallest part of that pyramid, right? So there's only so many buyers for it. So you really can't raise your prices too quickly. So I, I was the downfall for what I've learned, and this is good because maybe this will help some people because some people have probably bought some custom shop guitars from Fender or Gibson or Paul Reed Smith or other brands. And, you know, you're not in love with it, but then you look and you go, wow, I paid this insane margin. Let's say I paid $7,000 crazy numbers for this, you know, and you pay that. And then you're like, people are getting four grand. You're like, man, I'm going to lose three grand on this. What I will tell you is this. I don't want to get, I don't want, I don't want to think of guitars as financial tools okay this isn't a financial tool channel and uh, buy low sell high but what i will tell you is some things that you have to really learn if you're going to get involved in certain things the first thing that you have to think about and you need to seriously think about this when you buy think i want you to think about pricing of guitars and amps in exactly like a pyramid like i talked about so hundred dollar guitars are a wide amount of customers right two hundred dollar guitars three hundred dollar guitars four hundred dollars five hundred thousand two thousand Five thousand, seven thousand dollars. Like it's just a little tip. Um, you need to be in the long game, right? You got to play the long game, okay? And that's just to break even. So you buy a four thousand uh, dollar, uh, you know, a custom shop Gibson, which is they're not even four, and they're more, they're more. But let's say four or five thousand dollar custom shop Gibson, and you decide you don't like it. Unless you are going to want, are you okay with losing your money? You, that thing has to sit for years before you will get what people, you know, you paid for it, but you will because like anything, the prices keep going up on the high, on the new stuff. And then the used stuff follows that trend. Right. So, um, and don't bank on whatever happened during COVID. That was a fluke and it's probably correcting. Actually it is correcting as we speak. So some people are not going to get the money they paid for the stuff in COVID. Right. And, so, so that's the thing. So on this private stock, depending on the model, what it is, you got to understand on private stocks, just like custom shops, you can always find good deals on them sometimes because they're just something weird that nobody really wants. Again, you know, imagine how many people are in the market for a private stock guitar. Let's just use private stock because that's what you brought up, uh, burning sensation. How many people are in the market for a crazy expensive PRS? I mean, remember PRSs are crazy expensive just to the average guitar player. Just cores are crazy expensive, right? I mean, people are in the 2023, people are still pay, people are buying cars for the price of a core PRS, right? People buy a car, drive to a job, make a living, feed their children on the price of a guitar. So, oh, okay. My phone is going crazy here. All right. Sorry about that. So then, so that's crazy. Um, and then when you, like I said, when you go up, step up to the higher price, you have a very small market, right? Of people who are going to buy those guitars. 
But then as soon as you make those guitars even different, so like for the analogy, please go with me. Let's say we make a private stock PRS Custom 24 in, uh, you know, McCarty Burst, okay? So let's say, and you were listed on Reverb, seriously, no joke, there could probably be a dozen or two dozen, three dozen people in the entire world in the market for a guitar like that at any given time on Reverb, right? And so imagine, um, <laughs> that's not a lot of people. And then as soon as you go, oh, well, I have a custom, uh, private stock custom 24 in pink, not Bonnie pink, but just pink with, you know, uh, you know, some kind of weird inlay that people don't know. Then you just took that market and you shrunk it even more. So it's possible. I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen like Fender custom shop guitars that were selling new. In fact, I've, I've sold, I've bought and sold guitars like this. Uh, PRS guitars are uh, sorry, Fender guitars, Fender guitars that were $15,000 street price, no exaggeration. And I've sold them for $2,500 because there was just nobody in the market for that guitar. And even at $2,500, the only, I'll be honest, the only, well, I'm being honest, but I'm saying honest, the customer being honest, being the honest customer only bought it because he was buying a $15,000 guitar for $2,500. He didn't even really want it. It was some weird tele hybrid strat thing. And and in, in a rustic red with like distress on it. it was the weirdest guitar we've ever got and that wasn't used by the way uh fender couldn't sell it to a dealer <laughs> and then they basically like you want to buy it for nothing and i'm like okay and i think we bought it for two grand and i flipped it for 25. trust me i had delusions i was like i'll sell it for five grand this is great i'm gonna make three grand and then it sat and rotted and I think we went 2,500 on it. And the person who bought it was like, okay, I'm going to buy it. Same logic. He's like, oh, I'll make money on it. And he probably eventually did. He probably made a thousand dollars. I'm sure somebody probably gave him 3,500. So what I'm saying is, is that the price, it's not just the price. You have to be educated on what you're buying. And, and so my answer to your question, that's just the background of that stuff. Let me get to the heart of the question that matters, which is, you're saying $4,200 is a good price for a private stock McCarty in excellent condition. I'm not sure how much these things depreciate, how much are much reasonable. You're not saying any of the things that I want you to say. I, I want you to say, I love this guitar and I really want it. It's $4,200. Is that too much money to spend? See, sounds to me like you're already talking in a, in a, like I said, in a purchase flip situation or in an investment situation. And in my opinion, if you're going to invest money, guitars, I don't, I don't give any advice outside of guitars. If you're going to invest $4,200 in a guitar, um, unless you know exactly who you're going to sell it to for more money, I wouldn't suggest you buy that, right? Unless you're super educated on the product and know exactly what it is, I wouldn't buy that. And unless, of course, like I said, the easiest answer is always you really want it, you want it, you love the way it plays, it loves the way it sounds, it's really good, it's just a lot of money, it's a good decision that we could discuss but um but it is very possible even a private stock you could put forty two hundred dollars into a used private stock and you'll be lucky to get your forty two hundred dollars back or less depends on what it is and what it is that the person selling to you sees that you don't see because again we haven't even talked about there's issues with the guitar and stuff i've never been a fond a fond i've never been fond of that you know the buying a guitar because it's a good deal and you can make money on it later. Um, my my main thing, when I'm looking at good deals, it all has to do with an experience of it. Like I can buy this, try it, see if I like it, and then get out of it. That might be what you're after too, right? So maybe you're thinking, oh, maybe I want a private stock and this is the only way to get into a private stock affordably, or whatever, $4,200 obtainably, and you might be able to get out of it. But I'll caution you that even at $4,200, on a private stock this, that could be going for $10,000 new, you could be sitting on a problem. So I wouldn't recommend it, especially with the information I have from you, you know what I mean? Which is a one sentence thing. <laughs> so, I mean, with pictures and more stuff, we could probably flesh this out a little bit more. But again, I always caution people against that. Like I said, it's, it's, there are people who flip guitars for a living. They're all over the place. There is usually minimum one person per city that I've ever been in that literally makes a living flipping guitars on Craigslist and reverbs and all that stuff. And, um, you know, and some of them do it and some of them are good at it. Some of them do it really good at it. It's just never been my thing. You know, I'm more interested in the guitars, so I'm always cautious of it. 
And I will only, you know, the thing is like, you know, I only bet on a sure thing. It sounds like a sucker's thing to say, but same thing. I will bet on a sure thing. Like if I walk up and I go, you know, I know for a fact, like I've said this before, I bought Les Pauls just because I walked in like a guitar center or somewhere and I'm like, you know, Gibson Les Paul standard for $900. You're like, okay, look, I'm just going to buy this because obviously on its worst day, it's worth 1200 bucks on its worst day. And it, like I said, I don't even buy it to flip it and make money. I buy it because I always know somebody later who's like, like I told you, my last one I did that to actually went to Ralph. I bought this gold top because it was just such a good deal. And then I didn't even know what I was going to do with it. I just had it. And then it was like a year or two later, Ralph, I don't even think he knew I had it. And he one day mentioned, he goes, I think I'm going to get a gold last Paul and I got gold top last Paul. And I go, I have one in my closet in a case. I go check it out. He checked it out. He goes, awesome. He goes, what do you want for it? And I charge him what I paid for it. And, um, so, uh, Richard says there are YouTubers who flip. There's a lot of people who flip guitars. Look, we're all kind of flipping guitars. Even, even if, uh, uh, you know, even, even if you're not trying to flip guitars, obviously you buy guitars and you get rid of them because it's time for them to go and stuff. But yes, I understand what you're saying. Like I said, I just, I'm not a channel that's going to educate people on flipping guitars. It's not something I'm interested in teaching. And it's not something I even think I'm obviously I've, I've owned a store. So I understand how to buy something and sell something effectively on the market, but it's not, it was never where my passion was. So it's not something I'm really passionate to teach because I'm not passionate about doing it in the first place. Jimmy John says, why do you go on and on about the price things? Cause I was poor, man. I'm sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> um, when you're poor and you can't have anything, when you get to a point in your life, uh, when you can afford things, you, you think about that. Look, this is a, this is a, uh, and also I have, to, I have an audience, so you gotta understand, like, this is the hard part of this gig. There's, I mean, it's a really great gig, what I do, this, this show and this channel, but there's a difference that I have to keep clarifying to everybody. I make a living doing this. Like I make a living in the guitar industry and, uh, I make a good living doing it. So I talk to people understanding that like today, like, I don't know how many people are hanging out right now. Uh, there's eight people. Oh, there's 1200, 1200 people hanging out right now. Um, the majority of you are not making a living doing this. And because of that, you're taking funds from other things to buy things. So you have to be as educated as possible. Most people in my, ex look, especially I'm not talking about being poor, like I said, but if, but if, but you have to be educated unless you're, unless you have money to throw away, you have to be, you have to educate yourself so that you don't lose money. That's my opinion, it's whatever it is, right? Um, so you have to talk like that. Some people, I have friends and they don't even care and good for them, right? The problem for me is at this point, even though it's my job and it's an industry thing and I make good money and I have nice gear, um, I don't know this to be sure, but I'm telling you what I read. I read that I'm just mentally messed up because there was a time when I couldn't pay my electric bill. There was a time where I couldn't, like I said, put gas in my car. Uh, like I said, there's a time where I was literally homeless. My wife was literally telling that story, which was a weird thing to tell. <laughs> weird. She's telling her how about when we, when we started dating right, right before we started dating, I was basically homeless. So, um, it, so obviously, like I said, it's a mental thing. You think I, I do that, but mostly it's because I want people to be educated on the price of things. It's, a, it's not where I find the most joy talking about, but it is a factor. And if you can. And if you can make more educated decisions about your money with the thing you love, you can, you can enjoy it more. So that's why. Plus, like I said, I had a store for 13 years. So I can tell you right now, everyone's going to say that doesn't matter. Literally, it's the everything that everybody talked about. I've said this before. Uh, when people ask me what I miss about the store, and I tell people all the time, when I opened my store, I was naive enough to think that just like I, I, I use this analogy all the time, I thought like, I'm, if a person was into sports and they opened a sports bar so they could talk about sports with people all night, it was going to be the greatest thing ever. In my store, I spent 90% of my time negotiating prices with people and working on prices. It was more like a sales job because it's a store than it was a passion job. Um, I still liked it. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't what you thought. And I, I, I tell people all the time, you know, if people come in the store. I thought they're going to be like, I love guitars too. Let's talk about guitars. No, it was like, what could you get this out the door for me for? So there you go. Um, 
Homie Dane says, homeless and she kept you. She proves the character. Well, I wasn't actually homeless by the time we started dating, but I was homeless when we started talking again. We know each other since we were like 13. But more importantly, you can understand, she was broke too. We were broke. We were very broke people. Um, you know, we started out life like a lot of people. Uh, nothing. <laughs> Literally nothing. Um, and uh, so, like I said, you appreciate things differently. I read an article that said Julia Roberts, uh, they asked Julia Roberts if $100 was a lot of money. This is just what I read. I thought it was a funny story. And she said, yes, it's a lot of money, even though she's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And they said that's because she grew up not having money. And I guess mentally they said that's what happens when you have money is you just still think money, all money matters, right? So, all right, we're off that subject. <laughs> um... Okay, let's finish it up there. No more super chats. Let me let me do this because we're gonna run. We're running late. I've been too chatty today. No more after Dan Brown. No more super chats, and then I'll try to button up some of these. Um. Okay. Uh, I I have no idea. I'm gonna do the how this is the question. Hey Phil, going to Denmark, uh, street in London with some money to look for a cool old. Offset fender, what would you, what would you be mindful of dropping in a f uh, in? I think a few I th euros. I don't, not sure. Um, you know, I don't know. I've never been there, so I, I unfortunately I don't. I'm not very versed in it. I'm aware of what it is, but I, uh, Denmark Street in London. But I've never been there, and that's uh, that's maybe somewhere I need to go. So I don't know. Um, only thing I can tell you is I love the idea. I love the idea when I travel that I find this, uh, magical thing. You know, I know I'm using that word a lot. Like when I went to Nashville, I'm like, oh, find a guitar. And I go, you know, everywhere I go, when I travel, I always think like, I'm going to find this beautiful thing and bring it back with me. And I have forced that so many times and I've not come out better for it. So in other words, everywhere I go, I come back and I go, look what I bought. It's so cool. And 99, all the time, <laughs> not even 99%, every time. I don't have anything. Everything I bought in Nashville, everything I bought in Germany, everything I bought um, wherever I went, I don't have uh, because, like I said, I was. it was really about the moment for me, and I was, I was so excited. And, and I wanted this story. I just really feel like, you know, I, oh, I went on and traveled to, like you said, you know, where you went, you know, where you're going. I traveled to this place. I went to this amazing guitar store, and I bought this. And what I really found was I just found something to buy every time. So I caution you, uh, I've gotten a little better at it. Uh, and now, and I caution you that what I would give you is make sure you really like it. You, you'll, you're in, you're going to be an impulse by mood and uh, mode. And so please be aware of that. That's why I, for some reason, I don't know why I wasn't, <laughs> you know, I think that's something easy to tell yourself on the way there, you know, Hey, you're going to be an impulse by mode, but you, it's like, it's like going to Disneyland and buying, you know, some of the silly things you buy there or whatever. I just felt like, you know, just be aware that you're going to Disneyland and you're going to buy something stupid. So be cautious of it. If it's something you care about or, you know, spend the money if you don't care. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Mick 99 D says, always enjoy these interesting and humorous. Good job. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Billy Barrow says, Hey, uh, have a 10 Epi SG uh, 400. Okay, so that's an Epiphone SG 400. Suggestion for pickup upgrades for blues. Also, I didn't need it, but minutes ago bought a Vox <laughs> 8030 VT. Kind of cool thoughts. Um, on the Vox, I mean, I like the Vox amps, but I'll, I'll focus on your uh, guitar. On that SG, I would recommend either uh, the 57 Classics by Gibson and throw those in there. Fantastic. Um, you could throw in the... Um, uh, Seymour Duncan's, I would go see Seymour Duncan, like the 59 set would be in the great, great in there. JB and jazz works great, but I like the 59 set for that. Uh, really good. A dual set of, uh, DiMarzio PAF 36th anniversaries would be great in that, uh, guitar. Also, um, uh, some bare knuckle mules. I think those would sound great in the guitar. I, I like putting Gibson pickups in Epiphones. I find they sound almost exactly like the Gibsons then. <laughs> So, so that's where I kind of lean towards and, uh, look for used Gibson pickups and stick them in there. And a little trick with Gibson pickups that I, I, I sometimes fail to mention. One of the things about Gibson pickups that's really funny is, is you can just buy Chrome covers. I have a video showing you how to install Chrome covers. Anybody can do it. Even if you don't have a, uh, uh, 
anything, right? You don't have a soldering iron, even if you don't have anything. If you have a hot glue gun, that would really help in the situation. Uh, if you don't have a, a way to, to to wax pot them, you know, or you wouldn't have to wax them. They're always wax pot them, but, you know, dip them after you put the chrome covers in or put some wax in there. But like I said, um, sometimes when you're looking at Gibson pickups, you'll find like, so here's what I mean by that. Sometimes you can find a zebra Gibson pickup and then a, a black bob and zebra uh, pickup from Gibson, not zebra, but black bob and pickup. Just keep in mind, if you can buy some used Gibson pickups, you can just put chrome covers on them or nickel covers on them and throw them in the guitar. And like I said, just search my video, like look up pickup covers, Phil McKnight, and it'll come up. And um, just be aware, that's a way to save a lot of money, especially on Gibson pickups. I mean, sometimes you can find a Gibson pickup used, you know, for, for nothing, for, for less than a Seymour Duncan or DiMarzio and, and load them in there. So don't, don't be afraid of that. So uh, Steve Wright says, hey, if I want to build a lightweight Strat bolt-on, what are the best woods to use? Neck, walnut, mahogany, maple, uh, body, ash, mahogany. So the lightest you'll get a Strat is ash if you can pick the body or the body blank that you're going to use. Like I said, ash could be really heavy or really light and... Uh, don't fall for all the swamp ash and the terminal light ash, all that stuff. Don't, don't fall for any terminal terminology. Just like I said, if you can pick it, like if you're going to war moth or you're going somewhere like that, where you can pick, uh, I don't know if you can pick the weight or the body. Oh, you can pick it if it's already made from war moth and they'll give you the weight. If you can pick the weight of the body, you can get an ash body super light. So if you're trying to get light, you'll get it so light. It'll be stupid. The guitar will be like six pounds all, all done. Um, so think ash. Um, alder will be very consistent. You won't get super light, you'll, but you'll get reasonable weight most consistent with alder. Alder will be pretty consistent in most weights. Um, basswood, of course, will be super light uh, for a body. Mahogany would also be super light. Uh, maple will be heavy no matter what you do. I mean, the odds of you finding a, a maple body that will be light is uh, is almost impossible. I mean, it's it's like I said, like I said, almost impossible, <laughs> right? Um, so that's what I would look at for those as well. Uh, the juggernaut says, Phil, any thoughts on the 79th anniversary strat? I'm looking at these pricey, but within reach. Um, I don't know anything about it. So that's the first problem. <laughs> so I didn't know anything about the 79th anniversary strat. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I told you lately, I feel like Fender's had a lot of issues with, with quality, but most of that quality oh, with the guitars has to do with the fretwork and, and the wood not being dried out correctly, in my opinion, because uh, it's just shrinking so badly and giving you frat brad fret sprout. But that's something you can have fixed afterwards. So just be prepared for that. Um, so, I mean, that's my only suggestion. I mean, the guitar itself, I don't have any any thoughts on, but Fender quality right now, like I said, if you can't put your hands on it or get somebody to put their hands on it first and get, assure you that it's fine, I would definitely, just like I said, be prepared to add some repair to the cost of the instrument. Uh, SH Guitar Works says, hey, Phil, love the show. Have you, and wait, I love the show and you have helped my shop immensely over the years. When installing chrome covers on humbuckers, sometimes you have to unscrew each pole piece. Oh yeah, yeah, I have. I think I did that in the video a bit and get them flush. Will this affect the pickup? No, 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 not at all. Uh, no, uh, so what he's basically asking, great question, was when, you know, I told you when you put a chrome cover on, um, as soon as you put the chrome cover on, as soon as you compress it as hard as you can against the bobbins, you know, then you still have to unscrew or like, you know, uh, raise the screws so that they stick up to the chrome. Will that change it? It won't change anything. It doesn't change anything at all. Um, to the string, you understand, it's just relative from the screw to the string. That's all we really care about, right? So even though we've raised the screw higher out of the bobbin, the distance between the screw and the spring, uh, spring, sorry, the screw and the string is the same, right? So that's all you would care about. So that's that's all. So no, you don't have to worry about that. But that's a great question. Um, and something interesting enough, I've tested. So it's one of those things where like sometimes you go, I think, but I'm like, I know. I've, we, we tested it so many times when we were doing some, we we're doing a project with pickups once and I don't know why we were doing that, but that's one of the things we were testing and it didn't matter. Uh, the reason was we were we were curious what will change? So, you know, this is what the test showed us. What will change the sound is if we elongate like a pole or a screw, right? So in other words, obviously more material, the more magnetic, I guess it could become <laughs> is the best way to think about it. So there's more magnetic energy. So like, here's a, a good example. I don't know why I'm stuttering right now. I think it's because I'm being mindful of time. What I'm, what we did notice was is if like a staggered set of, of, 
uh, single coil pickups. Making the slug longer has an effect, but raising the slug up and down or raising the screw up and down, it doesn't change anything as long as said, as long as the, the distance between the string and that, uh, that slug or magnet or screw is the same. I hope that all made sense. I think it was pretty clear. Uh, Grumpy says my 50th present, 50th present. So 50th, he's turning 50, two years savings. Wait, I want to say my 50th present for two years saving vets pension of my two 12 slant cab DSL head with new 61 cherry Gibson, not head heavy. I am playing mine <laughs> and laughing my ass off. Um, Okay, so he's I basically saying he's uh he's for his pre his present, he uses Vet's pension uh to buy a 212 DSL head with a 61 cherry sunburst. That's awesome. I got a uh when I when I joined the army, um uh, I got a bonus. I got an army bonus. It was like a cool thing. Um and um the way it worked is they they paid it to you like way long. Like I thought I was getting it right away. I got a long, long like years later. <laughs> Whatever. It was a while. Maybe it was when years. It was a while back. And uh we bought a 32 inch TV. <laughs> and uh I so I'm just re relating to you. I, I know that feeling like, hey, this is my, you know, my my bonus. So I was really excited. That's what we bought with it. So it was our first real TV. We got a 32 inch TV. And for those young people watching, you can buy a 32 inch TV now for about a dollar eight thirty eight. <laughs> But when I bought a 32 inch TV, I think it was $700, 600 and something, $700. So, uh, I remember because, uh, we were so excited. We, we went into Best Buy, we bought the TV with my bonus, but we didn't have enough money for the stand for the TV. So we didn't have a stand. So we had to pay, we had to wait and save up a couple weeks. And then we bought a stand for the TV because <laughs> otherwise it sat on the floor. Uh, Let's see. Uh, thank you, Clem, for the super chat. It says, Damon says, my favorite part of the podcast is your thoughts on guitar, uh, psychologically and emotion. I, I like the talking about that too. I think it, I think it's because, um, I, I, well, I'm just saying, I think it's because, um, I think this is what I, when I read comments, I think this is what most of us are trying to figure out. This is an emotional instrument. It's emotional music. Music is emotion. It's emotion. So I'm glad you like it. I like it too says, I feel like a misfit because I'm best on a Jaguar and struggle with Les Paul Strat's tellies. Do I need guitar therapy? You don't need guitar therapy. You know, what's funny is, uh, that's exactly, look, your body shape, uh, comes into play, uh, with what, you know, shape guitar feels good. Your, um, you know, your, your length of your arms, your length of your legs, the, you know, just your age, everything kind of factors into what instrument, the way you sit, you know, where you position on your right leg or your left leg, uh, whether you stand or sit, all this stuff factors in. That's why it's, that's why there's so many different shapes and that's why there's so many things. And so, so, you know, I actually think the Jaguar, which is also like the jazz master for me, it's the jazz master because the Jaguars, the, the scale is just a little too short for me. Um, uh, but the jazz master, that body is super comfortable. So I agree to, for some reason, it really sits the most proper. I've just never found a jazz master that really synced up with what I, what I want, um, for the most part, but I, I love it. I always like, they always sing, they always put giant headstocks on the jazz master stuff. And I always wanted the, the headstock to be smaller. Cause I kind of feel like it dives a little bit if the headstock's a little heavy, but again, that's just how I sit and how the guitar sits with me. So no, you don't need therapy. Uh, and that, if anything, you figured it out, man, you figured out what works and that's important. My hard thing is it took me a long time to figure out what works. I E the S G I didn't like the way S G's looked. So therefore I didn't want to play them. <laughs> and then one day I was like, man, these are really comfortable and I like the way they sound. So it's like the perfect kind of fit for me. I like strats cause they fit really, really good with me as well. But, like Ellis Paul's just aren't very comfortable for me, but I love the way they sound and I love the way they look. So I force myself to play them from time to time because I love that about them, but they're not as comfortable. So I'm going to continue to play them because there's things I like about them, but they're not, isn't the most comfortable thing for me. Uh, Ryan says question, what do you make of the industry wide back orders and will they ever end? Nothing I want is available. 
you know, the back orders, obviously, obviously they had the supply chain issues. What I'm noticing is if it came from China, it's back in stock. Like it's like all the, like I said, it's like all the boats showed up in June of last year. And then literally we just saw the inventory go crazy and it's like, they can't get rid of it. Uh, it's so much inventory. Um, but that being said, everything else is still dealing with the back order because although everybody likes to point out that the market's slowing down, which it is, and things are slowing down because they are, the problem is, is like I said before, during COVID, it's like, imagine the speed limit at 75 miles an hour COVID. We were driving at 125. Now everybody's like, that's really, really slow. I'm like, right. But it's still like 83 miles an hour. We're still speeding. In other words, the industry's doing not as good as it was, especially since June of last year. That's really, if you, you could chart it almost, you could see where June was really the, the moment where we saw the market kind of start the, the downward, uh, uh angle on the graph, so to speak. But what's interesting about that is, is that if you look at most companies right now, when you look at the, and you look at most sales in the music industry, right? Industry right now, they're not worse than they were in 2019, which is pre COVID. And 2019 was a good year for the industry. So we haven't seen everything go to crap yet. Um, you can, people are going to put comments right now. Oh, it's all going to doom in three days or three months, right? There's always a doomsday thing. And I don't know that that's not true. So I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying, uh, I can only tell you what I see right now in front of me, which is the, that's why you're still seeing back orders because the demand has not dropped off to the point where they just, they don't have stuff. You know, they can just easily be back stocked on and stuff. It's really tricky. So, so what do I make of it? <laughs> that's what I make of it, right? There's still demand. That's the trick. You know, there's still demand. We're still, uh, we, we have slowed down, but we're not, uh, we have not recessed enough to where there's just more product than demand yet. It's probably coming. It, it, it will eventually, I'm not saying like doom and gloom because uh, who the hell knows, but it is slowing down and it will continue to slow down. It's not going to speed up back the way it was. I just don't see that happening soon. So, um, so there you go. You still have to be on some kind of waiting list for stuff. Um, thank you HK for the super chat. I appreciate that. Warren five says heard of 2003 court custom shop acoustic thoughts. I had no, I have no information on that. I didn't know, uh, court did a custom shop range, much less acoustic range. So I don't know, but I will tell you now, I'm curious tonight. I will look and see what I can find out about it. Curtis says, Ola Phil, I received my set of Wiggins pickups and a set of HBs, uh, humbuckers. Oh, okay. So Wiggins pickups and a set of humbuckers, uh, are on their way. What do you recommend for treble bleed caps on these sets? Uh, gracias. Gracias. I know I say it kind of so lame. Gracias. Um, but, uh, you know, it's tough. You know, I, I kind of, I kind of don't want to answer this question. Here's why, because I bought the mythos treble bleed. He's, he's got a treble bleed that is on a, like a PC board, but I guess you can change all the parameters of the different treble bleeds that are available. I think it's, and I bought it and I got it. And I just haven't had it well to test it. So I'm kind of concerned that I, whatever I tell you, I'm in a week or two, I'm going to be like, no, this is the thing to get. Um, but the one I show in my, the one I use, here's what's easy. The treble bleed I use is in my treble bleed video. So that's, what's great. Curtis is just go like right to that. I'll timestamp this, but also you can go right to Phil McKnight treble bleed and it'll come right up. That's what I use. I I've tried all the treble bleeds. There's a lot of comments in those videos. And some of those comments are probably gonna be useful to you. A lot of people are like, no, you have to use this and you have to use that. And what I found is, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> I just use the treble bleed. I've tried so many different ones and you know, if you AB them again, this one's like, oh, this one's this and this one's that. But realistically, I just, you know, whatever's the cheapest works for me. Fine. I haven't found any problems with that. Uh, Dan Brown, Dan Brown says, if you could only use one, what would you pick between a multi effects pedal or plugins? Um, a multi effects pedal. Uh, I, 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 I'm a kind of a broken record on certain things and here's what it is. My entire goal in life is to get the hell away from my computer and my phone. <laughs> um, I love my computer. I love the phone. I has made literally, I couldn't, I not only couldn't live with it, I couldn't make a living without them. This is how I make a living. I literally on the internet. This so the internet is that, that being said, I have no interest to be around my computer on my phone when I'm not working, even though my work is kind of a cool, you know, joyful process. Cause I do guitar for a living, um, guitar stuff. But, um, 
it, so that's why that's the only reason why it, all day on a computer, answering emails on zoom calls, making content, editing on the phone all day, doing stuff all day. I know the, not, you know, phone's not really what you're talking about, but same thing. I, my goal is to get away from this stuff. So, so much. So, so the fact, so you understand my mission to do that is so powerful. I, I physically have two phones. So I have two phones. Look, they're right here. <laughs> so you guys know I'm not crazy. I have two phones. And uh reason is, is because I own a phone. This is my wife's ingenious idea. She's, she is so, uh, much smarter than me, which is, uh, if you can do that, if you can find somebody smarter than you and get them to be around you all the time, I recommend it. Um, the second phone doesn't have any way for me to work on it or do anything other than just physically my kids can get a hold of me if there's a, you know, if we go for a bike ride or something, right? So we can get an emergency cases. So I have an emergency phone. So it's just so people can get a hold of me so I can put the phone down and stream music when I'm riding my bike and have emergency calls. Like it's just a basic phone for that purpose. And so that's why I'm giving you that answer. I love plugins. I use them, but literally I just want to get the hell away from computers and phones when I can. So I would use a multi effects because that's the same reason I want to plug into tube amp. You know, there's something great. I didn't understand records for a long time. I'm not a generation. We're going to end on this note, by the way, I'm not the generation of records. I'm old, but I'm in a weird old age where my first experience was cassettes. Right. That's what I, my first music was on cassettes. I, my sister who was older than me, um, records, she had records. Um, but I was cassettes. And then shortly after cassettes, it was CDs. I didn't get CDs for a long time because they were expensive. I didn't buy CDs until the day that they were the same price as cassettes or less. <laughs> right. I remember the first day I like, walked into a warehouse records and tapes store and that never had records, by the way. I, I don't even, I don't even remember going into a warehouse records and tapes uh, with records or tower records. I don't remember them ever having records. Uh, my whole, my whole time when, since I got into music. So I go in and cassettes. Um, the reason I say this is everybody told me to get records. My friend who owns a record company, rap Pat records, which is Joe. He's amazing. He sends me records. Everybody's like, yeah, try records. Here's what I've learned about records. Same thing as like the tube amps. When you're in that analog environment, it's a calm environment. <laughs> That's what I love about a good amp and a guitar or just a good acoustic guitar. There's just, sometimes I love the technology. I love it. That's why I do videos on it, interfaces, plugins and stuff. But for me, sometimes, and I recommend this, especially if you're much younger, um, technology, obviously you've been wrapped in it your whole life, right? It's like a blanket around you, like a baby, right? You've been in technology is, is this warm thing to you, I'm sure. And, and I love technology. It's great, right? However, there's just something blissfully amazing about not having technology for periods of time, right? Um, so, uh, in fact, I, I feel horrible. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Uh, a good friend of mine was telling me, I'm saying, the uh, reason is I, you know, it wasn't my saying, so I'm going to give credit. Um, he was saying that, um, basically he was telling me he was going on a digital detox. I was like, oh, I love that idea. That's great. So that's what I call, I'll call that too, because that's a great term for it is, uh, so if you ask me what if I can only have one thing, I'll have something that basically lets put that's that lets me have a digital detox. All right, we did it. We went long today, but uh, you guys had a lot of questions. I hope I didn't miss a super chat. If I did, I will make sure we scoop it next week. Um, so on that, and I know we talked about doing a giveaway. I was going to try to give us a Snarkway tuner today, but obviously I, I messed that up too. So, but we'll just do double up next week, and that kind of works out better for me because I can probably do something a little cooler because I didn't put, obviously I don't have it in the room. I didn't grab it. Like I thought we want to do some giveaways on the tuners, but we're trying to figure out the best way to do this. And like I said, we want to do it on Instagram as well. So we'll figure that out. Well, thank you for being patient on that. As always, I want to thank you guys so much. It was a lot of people today and a lot of great subjects and, uh, and hold on a second. And now I'm getting a message that's, oh yeah. Um, I know. Uh, so I, <laughs> It's about the, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go and uh, you guys have an amazing weekend. In fact, uh, after the show, go take a digital detox and go play some music through hopefully something analog or something that's not plugged into your device. And on that note, uh, I'll see you guys next week and uh, thank you for your time and know your gear. <laughs>